hello if you're watching the VOD. Um, I usually set up chapters uh, after the video publishes, so you can jump ahead to when we really start if you like. Um, we'll give people a few minutes to trickle in here. Hey, getting started soon. So I will see you in a few minutes. Ah, hey, Meland. How's it going, bud? Good, good. It's really early in the morning for you, isn't it? <clears throat> oh, I'm well, thanks. Um, I felt a little sick uh, this weekend, so I didn't I didn't feel like streaming. Um, and. Uh, yeah, but I but I but I got over it now. So you haven't slept. Oh, that's not good. Unless you were up having fun. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, insomnia sucks. Uh, one of the one of the reasons I haven't um, done a stream on sleep yet is because I want to finish my work on Clostridium difficile and how it can contribute to insomnia. And it's such a complicated. I mean, it's one of the most virulent bacteria, and, it, and 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 everybody has it. And like, I was just reading um, some studies about how it can travel up into your gallbladder and infect your liver and your gallbladder. And um, yeah, it's just it's really really complicated. Um, yeah, you were having fun. <laughs> okay, that's if that's what you meant. That's good. So I'm gonna do I'm gonna do a stream on insomnia soon. Um, when my work finishes. Um, oh, well, um, uh, hey, Yorg, welcome. Um, I wouldn't characterize that as a cure. That's why, like, my chapter on insomnia is titled How to Sleep When You Can't, because I only figured out some aspects of insomnia, not all of them. And I think one of the ones that I was missing was the connection between um, infection with Clostridium difficile and insomnia, um, because it because Clostridium difficile uh, promotes uh, it, it stimulates high adrenaline in order to release uh, sugar from glycogen storage, and that uh, that high adrenaline really contributes to insomnia because it, it tends because clostridium difficile tends to do that in between meals in order to harvest sugar from our um body and not actually sugar though it actually uses sorbitol which is a intermediate between like this is one this is one of the really funny things about like the people about sugar and and debates about sugar um um, almost all of the, or not the, almost all, but the majority of glucose that cells uptake convert into fructose, which is the, you know, the evil sugar that everyone decries, you know, in, in a lot of nutrition circles, like your own cells make fructose from most of the glucose that you ingest. And that pathway is called the polyol pathway. And, um, uh, and in, and in, an intermediate in that pathway is called sorbitol, and the and C difficile, Clostridium difficile, is actually after the sorbitol. That's one of the reasons why it stimulates the glucose release because then the glucose um, enters the cells and starts to convert into uh, fructose, and 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 then C difficile interrupt uh, intercepts the sorbitol in that process. And actually, and 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 I, I, I greatly suspect, um, I'm, I'm not the only one, but I think that uh, C. difficile is also involved in like diabetes for that reason. Um, so having symptoms like trouble sleeping, 
And blood sugar management is a symptom of being infected with Clostridium difficile, um, which has proven extremely difficult for a high school graduate to figure out. <laughs> so it's taken me a while, but I've actually been making some really good progress and I'm pretty confident that I'll be getting to the conclusion pretty soon. And then once I do, then I will be doing a stream on insomnia and then I'll end writing a, and writing a book on, um, writing a book, updating my book on, um, uh, af after that. So, um, like Tuesdays are really slow for streaming, um, for, for viewing. So there's not a lot of people here yet, but I'll, I'll but I'll go ahead and, um, start getting into what we're going to be talking about. Um, Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, if you guys don't know, I uh, talk about health stuff. Uh, I have kind of like a prepared... Hey, Mike. Welcome, welcome. Haven't seen you for a little while. How are you doing? Um, I, For those of you that don't know, I talk about health things and then um, like a subject that I want to kind of focus on. And then I open up everything to Q&A. And you, you can also interact with me and, 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 and ask Q&A early. Um, yeah um now even anyway i i just don't always pay attention my brain i have a very one track mind and so i don't always pay attention to what's going on in the chat so if i don't see your chat sorry um but i will get to a, a q a section dedicated for question and answer later um oh thanks melinda yeah uh yeah you've supported my work for a long time i i know you believe in me your support means a lot um uh, I mean, there is every possibility that I don't. I mean, you know, I am, I have taken on something that's extremely difficult and, but I, I've actually, the, but my latest progress that I make, I was actually getting sort of demoralized, um, a few months ago when it just seemed like I just didn't know what to research. Uh, most of the studies that I had come across were not helpful and, um, and uh and and it's just it's really really virulent and difficult and <coughs> excuse me so I, and there's not a lot of information that's useful on it because science doesn't understand it generally so i can all that i can really do is read studies and um and then do self-experimentation on myself and um so i was i was getting kind of depressed wondering if i was gonna make progress but i actually did stumble on some new stuff that has led me down a path that i think will pay off uh very well so i'm so i'm so i'm excited about that um oh did i mike did i say if i were familiar with dr gabor gabor um no he connects trauma with addiction um, I, I don't know him. I'm sorry, Mike, you always, you, Mike, you, you seem to be extremely well informed as to contemporary, um, researchers and, and, and professionals, but I, I, I don't, um, <laughs> I, I don't keep up with anybody because pretty much nobody knows more than I do, uh, about anything really that I'm doing. And so it just isn't profitable for me to even look at their work or, or, you know, and, um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, trauma and thank you for the segue. Yes. So, so we're going to be talking about trauma today. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, yeah, Mike, um, <laughs> oh, excuse me. And, uh, uh, yeah, so, uh, uh, you know, I have, so the last stream that I did was depression and then I did another one several, uh, weeks, a few weeks ago on alcoholism and addiction. And if you, if you, if you specifically suffer from depression or, or addiction problems or alcoholism, uh, go listen to those. Um, they're, they're very helpful. Um, you know, again, to, uh, these are just, um, this is, these are just, uh, outlets for me to talk about my work. Uh, I can't cover everything that's in my books in these streams i forget there's also a lot i mean my book is uh just under 500 pages long and trust me i've tried i've cut it down i've, I've it has it's 250,000 words i've probably written a total of 500,000 um in crafting it and and that's just my first book not my second book which my second book is specifically focused on trauma as well 
um, especially because um, trauma uh, originates in childhood. Um, and actually, I was before I wrote my second book. So my first book is Fuck Portion Control. Um, and the second one is The Perfect Child. And you can find both of them through the links um, in the description of this video. Um, I was I, I knew that I wanted my second book to be specifically about trauma, but I didn't really know the best way to go about writing it because, um, you know, there's uh, because trauma originates in childhood. And if you want to uh, if you actually want to try to stop trauma from happening, um, you need to empower parents to help teach and um, their children and prevent um, trauma from happening to their own children. So I decided to anchor the book in, um, in, uh, uh, you, oh, you, you use Speechify for my books. Oh, that's great, Melinda. Yeah, some people have been asking me if whether or not why I don't do an audiobook, and I, I, I will probably do audiobooks. Um, a, a lot of the reason I haven't made it a priority is because I, I'm still working on my books. Like they're not, they're not finished yet. I, I, I add updates to them frequently, which you get for free if you buy it. And if, if you don't know about that and you don't, you're not getting my updates, check your spam because the, 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 I, I think, I think a lot of the people that get the ebook update think that they have to pay for it, but it's free. I always send out a, a, a code so that you can get it for free. So, um, so keep an eye out for that. Um, but, um, so I haven't done that. And, and because I'm also still just doing ongoing research, making an audio book of them, um, just seems like a lot that I can't handle at the moment. <laughs> so, um, so I, I, but also too, like a lot of the, a lot of the content that's in the books is sort of like work that you've got to do. You need to write down, um, stuff that you need to do, take notes, um, you know, because you won't remember where you read something in the book. Like I said, it's almost 500 pages long. Like you need to be paying attention. And a lot of people want to just listen to audiobooks because they don't like reading and they just want to listen. So, but you know, however the information gets out, you know, um, is, can be useful and productive. So I will do it. I had audiobooks in the future, but not anytime soon. So um, anyway, so I was I was trying to figure out like how how to talk about trauma, what was the best way to approach it, what would be the most effective way to neutralize it to stop it from happening. Um, we can't stop all trauma, but the the amount of trauma that is occurring, um, you know, generally is ridiculous. Um, I like I make this comparison in my book that um, so so I have an enormous extended family. Um, I have over 100 cousins. Um, and especially now that my cousins have been having children, that's even like, you know, second cousins, like it's probably up to 150 to 200 family members, um, in total. And, um, I have, uh, let's see, there's seven on my dad's side and six on my mom's side. So that's 14 plus 12, um, aunts and uncles. And, there's only one couple of the entire group that I would describe as kind and happy people. <laughs> All of the others are angry and hateful and spiteful and miserable. Oh my God, they're miserable. And the things that they've done to their children too, like my book, you know, I talk a lot about the trauma that my parents put us through growing up and my parents were not the worst by far. My parents were probably except for the one that there's one couple that's happy and um, happy ish. I mean, you know, as much as anyone can be in, in, in those generations. Um, but they did a good job raising their children. And I love that. I love my cousins from that family. And actually, I love a lot of my cousins, even the ones from the traumatized families. <laughs> Let's be real. Even though they're fucked up, like they're brilliant. And I, I just love them. Um, but a lot of them turned out to be racist, bigoted, homophobic as well. And, um, but, but my one aunt and aunt and, aunt and uncle who are, um, who are, uh, the least who aren't mean and they're actually very kind and wonderful and I love them so much. And, um, there's only one set of them in, in that entire, um, uh, uh, in that whole, the huge amount, huge family that I have. Um, and anyway, so, so I was, I wanted to, I was, so I was trying to, okay. So like, so, so I overcame a lot of my own trauma. 
that's the whole point of why I'm even talking about this because of my particular experience, um, first starting out being, um, sick and investigating a lot of science to try to get better from my cancer, my thyroid disease, my erectile dysfunction, my insomnia, my weight gain. Um, and part of that journey, as a lot of you guys know who've read my book, uh, started out from being an alcoholic and getting into the Alcoholics Anonymous program. And through in, in in that program, there's a part. So a lot of people, a lot of a lot of you know about like the twelve steps. Like you heard about the twelve steps. Um, there's a lot of God and weird stuff in Alcoholics Anonymous, but part the the twelve a lot of the twelve steps are actually really useful, and it's one of the reasons why it's actually pretty productive in getting people sober um, is because part of that therapy that's in there um, is actually effective in addressing some of some trauma that is at the root of alcoholism and addiction. Um, and uh, but they don't really talk about it like in those terms in the program. It's more like that you just need to do it. They don't the people who made the program, it was made, you know, like a long time ago. Um, back before there was really any good um, mental health therapy at all, and 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 the mental health therapy available today, don't get me wrong, it is not good, but it's better than what what it was. But um, they didn't they didn't know why it worked. They just stumbled. They happened to stumble on um, the process by which our brains uh, imprint learning experiences, um, and the uh some of the some of the therapy that is in the 12 step program helps to undo a lot of the trauma that you experience as a child and effectively like and what it actually does like the reason that it actually is effective is because it ends up helping addicts and alcoholics feel for the first time in their lives feel empowered to actually care for themselves which is actually at the fundamental root of why the addiction and alcoholism exists in the first place um essentially people who are alcoholic and addict lack skills to care for their own well-being um and without having those skills they can't can care for their own well-being and it creates a lot of stress and trauma in their lives um on top of the stress and trauma that came from childhood and then the only way to a treat to treat that stress is with, you know, self-administering of drugs and alcohol. But a lot of us can have trauma regardless of if we're addicts or alcoholics at all. Um, in fact, most of us do have trauma. Um, a lot of us don't even recognize that we have trauma or don't want to recognize that we have trauma. I mean, Jesus Christ, I had so much trauma as a child that I tried to kill myself when I was 21. And like, you know, I didn't even recognize that that was trauma because I didn't have the skills to recognize it or to take care of myself. And, um, you know, and, 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 and that becomes part of the problem in trying to empower and help people with trauma is that a lot of us don't even recognize that we have trauma because it is our only experience. You know, the, the, the parents that you have growing up, the, uh, particular siblings that you have growing up and the experiences that you have growing up, are the only experience that you have. And if that does not include skills such as how to recognize and address trauma and take care of yourself, you don't even know that you have it. And so you try your best though, you know, you struggle along, you try to make yourself a, a success and you try to do your best in spite of the problems that you're having. Um, you know, um, uh, that's all that you can uh, very often do. And I didn't learn until I was like 36, 37, that a lot of the problems that I had as an adult were because of the kind of trauma that I went through as a child. I didn't recognize that I had had the trauma until it was resolved by practicing in the, the, the particular um, trauma therapy in the, in the, in the 12 step program, but it's not presented as trauma therapy in the 12 step program, even though that's what it is. And they don't recognize the psychological, um, implications of the trauma of the program. I mean, and I did, and I also recognized its insufficiencies. So I sort of evolved what they do. I took the parts out of it that are actually effective and evolved them in a, a psychology, um, application, to more directly and purposefully target trauma and resolve it in a way that is less, um, uh, um, well, like, so, so, uh, in a, it can sometimes in a come across like it's, um, 
condemning you sort of like making you feel bad for the things that you've done and a trauma and therapy needs to be objective. And so I took out a lot of those, um, unhelpful aspects of it and evolved it in my, and I also evolved it in the context of the, um, Karpman drama triangles model of trauma, which is, uh, a very, it was, it's probably the only, um, really comprehensive characterization of what happens to us when we're traumatized, um, and the effect that it has on our lives. And I'd been looking for that for a long time, actually, like even before, even while I was still an alcoholic, when I would like read health books or self-help books or look into scientific, um, you know, um, uh, research on, um, mental health therapy, I was always trying to find a an effective explanation for why I was the way that I was because of the trauma that I went through. And it was not available. I could not find an adequate answer for that. Most of psychological therapy from psychologists are uh are basically just like talking about your problems and having a therapist listen to your problems. And that's not really helpful. Cognitive therapy kind of gets close because it asks you to actively be a participant in your in your healing. And um hey Yorg. Um thanks for that. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll since that one's unrelated to what we're talking about, I'll ask I'll answer that later when we get to the QA. Um uh uh, but welcome. Uh, I wanted you to know I saw your question. Um, I need a drink of coffee. Hang on. Uh, so um, when I when I was like when I was like developing um, inventory therapy, which is in my book, and um, trying to like find out how like how how our psyche is affected by trauma specifically, not just that it is, but how like like how to characterize exactly what happens to the human brain when you go through experiences of trauma um the answer was the uh stephen cartman uh model tra uh, drama triangles model of uh of 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 uh psychological fracturing uh and um conflict triangles um and it was very helpful and productive and, and it it also informed a lot of how my book ended up, um, materializing. And so, um, so, so I was trying to find like, a, a, like what, like what context should I present all of this therapy in? Because if I were to talk about it in the context of addic addiction and alcoholism, which in fact, I'm sure that some people have already heard me say that and have checked out of the conversation because they don't identify as an addict or an alcoholic. But, um, that's not the point. The point is trauma, not addiction and alcoholism. And, um, if I wrote my book in that context, only people who identified as alcoholics and addicts, which also most alcoholics and addicts don't actually identify as them, you know, they live in a state like I did live in a state of denial because you feel powerless over your trauma. Um, it wouldn't, nobody would pick it up and it wouldn't be relatable. Um, but I have a lot of siblings too. And I, as a result, I have a lot of nieces and nephews <laughs> and I have like, you know, a good 10, 15 years of watching my siblings raise their children and seeing the patterns of abuse and neglect that were first committed from my parents onto me and my siblings and then being handed down to um, my nieces and nephews. And, you know, that started a long, long time ago, you know, uh, the, a trauma is a intergenerational inheritance process where children are traumatized then grow up to be parents who do traumatized who do abuse and a lot of times parents don't even know that they are doing the abuse um, and that is one of the reasons why it continues to perpetuate from generation to generation um, in my book the perfect child i relate this experience of coming home to see my parents for the first time in three years after um, my ex, my fiance leaving and um, be entering into Alcoholics Anonymous. And, you know, superficially, that might sound like I was a drunk and unmanageable. And so a choice person left me, but they actually relapsed into cocaine addiction <laughs> and uh, and and left me for kind of reasons like that as well. And so and it was just a dysfunctional relationship. 
And so anyway, but so I didn't see my parents for three years. One of the reasons I didn't go back home for three years was not because I was trying to get sober. It was because I didn't have a partner and I didn't have anyone on my side to feel um, bolstered by when I would be visiting my parents. Um, when I would go see my parents and I had my partner, I felt safe because he was somebody that I could count on to um, support me. Um, my parents are terrifying to me. I don't like seeing them. They are awful and they treat me horribly. Um, and, um, so I, you know, so I didn't go home and see them for three years. Um, and then, but when I did finally get the courage to go and see them, um, I was, uh, uh, there, uh, there was a particular experience one day when I was with my father and we were, um, he was, it was like a Saturday and he was like doing work. And I hadn't seen him for three years and he was working on a Saturday and when I'm visiting and he wouldn't spend time with me. And so I was trying to get him to watch this cooking show um, called Cooked on Netflix with Michael Pollan, which, by the way, is such a fantastic series on food and why we cook. You guys write it down. You should watch it. Um, and um. I was purposely also staying away from politics and somehow he brought up politics and I got sucked into it a little bit, but I wasn't also, I was also not arguing with him about it. And, um, Oh, I think it was because I was, um, I was encouraging him to start building their next house, which is what they had been planning on doing. And I was, I encouraged him to do it sooner than later because I said, it looks like the economy is going to implode. And he got so mad at me for saying that. And I don't, I still to this day don't understand why, because it's not like he personally controls the economy. Like that's not an insult. Like, like, and, and also for someone as old as he is and has been through so many economic, um, down, uh, ups and downs should recognize that the economy is never a hundred percent stable, that it goes through these cyclical processes. It's not like, it's not like, it's not like the economy has never gone under, like it, it went under like five or six times since I was born. Um, and it wasn't a reason to get mad at me, but he got so mad at me and he started yelling at me and treating me like I was some kind of socio-political adversary instead of his son that he hadn't seen in three years. Um, and I have never really um, felt threatened by my dad. Like he was, he never hit us growing up ever. Like he was verbally abusive, but he never like physically like struck us or beat us or anything like that. And, but that day, that was, that day was the first time in my life that I thought my dad might hit me. And, um, and, and, and I'm, I'm like six inches taller than him though. <laughs> and probably good, like a good hundred pounds on him. And, uh, but I was, but I don't, I don't want to hit people. And, uh, even if they attack me and, um, but I was scared from my, I, I actually got scared from my well being, And because also I had just been recovering from cancer and alcoholism, I was still pretty weak and it made my legs go shaky. And I had a really hard time even standing up. Um, and he left and I just like, I cut the visit off quick or early and, and I, and I left. And, um, so as I was driving home, um, to California from Utah. Um, it's a really long drive. It's actually my, one of my favorite things to do is make the drive from Salt Lake city to, to Los Angeles. Um, well, more specifically to Vegas, after you get past Vegas, the traffic picks up, but the drive between Salt Lake city and, um, Las Vegas is so serene and beautiful and uh, it's just fantastic. And, um, but I was feeling really sad, you know, and, and, uh, having a hard time with what had happened. Um, and I was trying to understand like why their generation is like that because all baby boomers are angry and resentful, even though they're one of the wealthiest generations of human beings to have ever existed in the history of humanity. They are self-centered and bigoted and hateful and angry and dissatisfied and you know, they have everything. They have so much money and healthcare and food and like resources that humans have never had before in human history, except for the, you know, the very small few, but even like, you know, even like, even like Kings from, you know, um, you know, uh, the middle ages, they didn't have running water or electricity, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like 
baby boomers, the baby boom generation generally has so has more wealth individually than even like, you know, wealthy royalty had back in the day. And they are not wanting for things and stuff. And yet they are so miserable. And I was trying to understand why, because I didn't get it. I just, I really did not understand why my parents were the way that they were. We had a really um, prosperous childhood where uh, mostly my parents had um, economic troubles occasionally, but we were never homeless. We always, we usually had a really nice house to live in. There was no reason to be angry or dissatisfied. And yet they were constantly. And, um, and, and trigger warning for school shootings and stuff like that too, for anybody listening. Um, this also occurred right after the Parkland, um, shootings. And, um, I was, and I, you know, I was on this drive from Salt Lake city to Los Angeles. So I had a lot of time to just think about stuff and, Suddenly the image of children um, doing school shooting drills or actual shootings, uh, the image of them hiding under desks reminded me that the baby boomer generation also went through that. As children, they were constantly being told that they were going to be immolated by nuclear weapons from omniscient or foreign powers that we were, you know, powerless to like, you know, um, resist, um, you know, during the, the, the whole cold war, but the cold war wasn't even the only thing like, you know, baby boomers were raised by the world war two generation and the world war two generation was raised by the world war one generation. But during the baby boom generation specifically, there was not just, there wasn't, there was wars like um, all, there were also wars like the Korean War and um, Vietnam. And on top of that, there was also the Cold War with Russia and their entire childhood was basically nothing but one violent propaganda piece uh, after another. And there's actually a cartoon from the time which is frightening. It's so fucking, I can't believe that this is even made even back then by those standards. Um, there's a cartoon. Um, Oh, I forget the name of it right off the top of my head. I mentioned it in my book. Um, it is a, of a, uh, turtle walking down a road, cartoon turtle, and he's wearing a hard hat and he walks underneath a, a, a tree where a squirrel, I think is a squirrel is, um, is uh drops a firecracker on his head and like this is a cartoon meant to introduce the concept of nuclear holocaust to children it's like a looney tune style like russia's gonna drop a nuclear bomb on your head and you're gonna be burned to death um to sh be shown to school children um the film though uh later it segues away from cartoon and goes into like real real life footage and there are these horrifying scenes of like children running from a playground with sirens wailing, which is superimposed um, with flames, like in absolutely insane shit. Like and and also and and when I like so and like my my parents refused to read my books. Um, my mom has read a little bit of Fuck Portion Control for her own health problems um, f much later than after the fact after they occurred. Um, after I published my book <laughs> and, um, and, uh, and, and, but they refused to read it. So, and then what, but one day I did have, I was actually explaining to my mom, like the concept, like what's behind the perfect child and why I wrote it. And I started off with this same story, like telling her about, you know, like my drive from Salt Lake to LA after my dad treated me that way. Uh, what, came to mind about the parkland children and and and, uh, and children cowering under their desks and i was going to make the comparison to their experience my mom just immediately goes oh yeah that's what we did as children like we that we had all these nuclear drills all the time as kids that we did we had to go through that too and i, I was just i was just amazed that she didn't make the connection like the entire point 
Uh, yeah, Melinda, it's like, it, it's uh, like, you sh you guys should look it up. Actually, let me, here, let me, let me look it up. Um, YouTube. Um, turtle. Squirrel. <laughs> nuclear. Bomb cartoon. Um, oh, there it is. Uh, it's called Duck and Cover. 1951 Bert the Turtle. Um, so anyway, so, so, um, so I, I had this epiphany and, 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 I, and I'm, 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 I'm by no means the first person to connect intergenerational trauma from, um, you know, parenting to children, blah, blah, blah. But this was a, this was a very, very stark demonstration of how trauma gets passed down from generation to generation. Um, because traumatized parents and society in general from World War I and World War II, when the baby boomers, when baby boomer generation were being raised, actively passed on their trauma to their own children. Like telling children about nuclear holocaust will do absolutely nothing to prepare them for the event of a nuclear holocaust. They'll just be dead. <laughs> there is no reason to tell them about it at all that is helpful in any way whatsoever. But using violent propaganda to traumatize people is a really effective method to control them, to make them afraid, to gain political power. And that was one of the strategies of like the Eisenhower administration, because, you know, Eisenhower came off of World War II very victorious as a big public figure and then segued into um, uh, in, into po politics and the presidency. And being a man of war who thrived and benefited from war, um, you know, naturally wanted instinctually to continue that hold on power, which was born from violent conflict. And so, you know, him and, and everybody else in the country that was had the same mindset was like, oh, we need to prepare our children for, you know, nuclear holocaust and all these realities uh, that happened during war. But it doesn't benefit children. They don't, you cannot prepare a child to be prepared for a nuclear bomb dropping on your city. That just, that you can't do that. It doesn't do anything. They just die. <laughs> they don't need to know about how they are going to die. The entire point of the exercise is to invoke fear and trauma, even though that might not be the forefront on the, uh, for the thought on the forefront of the minds of the people who are making and distributing it. They're not thinking, Oh, I want to traumatize the children, but those people themselves are traumatized and don't recognize it as trauma. And so they, uh, fail to then protect the next generation from that same kind of trauma because they went through it and don't recognize it as trauma. So anyway, so that's basically the, like why, like, uh, how I started recognizing, um, the, the the processes of trauma and how they are perpetuated from generation to generation. And because I had done a lot of work for myself in resolving my own trauma, I was able to recognize how the things that my parents did, what they did and said to me and to other people originated from their own experiences of trauma. And that helped me not to excuse their behavior, but to have more compassion for myself, having gone through that stuff. That no, it never really was actually about me. Like, even though they behaved toward me in that way and made characterizations about me as a person, it was actually never about me. It was about their own trauma being um, uh, exercised in... Uh, through my existence as their child. And so as I got to understand that, that actually gave me a lot more control and power over my own trauma because I had a lot of context in which I could actually utilize the inventory therapy to address and treat my own traumatic experiences. Um, and then the Karp Karpman drama triangle model helped me understand how the psyche, the human psyche specifically, how, how it is specifically affected by those experiences and why people become um, abusive um, 
personality types like narcissists and um and uh you know um, people with excessive self-pity and shame control behaviors and stuff like that the cartman drama triangle um model explains that very very effectively um but one of the reasons that you also don't really hear about the cartman drama triangle in um the context of therapy is be is because the therapy industry doesn't really use it and part one of the reasons they don't really use it is because it actually is effective um and i this is a really brief and in um in a, uh, uh, um, uh, insufficient explanation, but most psychologists are the helper, the type two helper personality of the Cartman drama triangle uh, model, wherein people need to feel they have a purpose in order to have value and identity. And so they enter the um, therapy profession in order to be a vector um between people's conflicts and problems and thereby getting um benefit of uh, for themselves out of it and so they don't actually teach the cartman drama triangle um um uh model even though it is a highly highly accepted and respected model within the psychiatry profession um because it's actually effective um and um uh mike uh Cartman drama triangle transactional analysis practices. In, oh, it is practiced in UK. That's really cool. I didn't know that. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, being in North America, I never heard about it until I happened to stumble on it through my research that I was doing, <laughs> even though I had been to like a dozen, not a dozen. I can't, I don't know how many therapists I've been to in my life. I went to, I went to a handful when I was with my ex for couples therapy. And then I went to another like two handfuls uh, on my own when I was younger and struggling with depression and things like that. So, um, um, and I, I talk about that experience and I think the stream on depression, like I, one, um, only one therapist of the, you know, almost a dozen that I went to, um, was ever actually helpful toward, toward me. And she was a psychiatrist and psychiatrists tend to be more effective than psychologists because psychiatrists, um, are required to have biological instruction and they understand more of the actual biological pathways that are involved in depression, whereas psychologists only focus on the uh, psyche and that's not efficient, uh, uh, that's not effective because there is a major amount of endocrinological factor, hormones and neurology that are involved in depression um, and trauma, um, like I talk about in my um, last stream on depression. Um, and because they don't address that, they don't, they're not effective really. So the, the one person that helped me and she didn't even, um, prescribe me any psych meds. She actually, she was really great. She, she, um, she said she didn't like prescribing psych meds and that she preferred to avoid them if possible. And she didn't even, she didn't even drug me up. Um, she just taught me, she was like the first person that ever taught me like breathing exercises to like help me like relax and stop having panic attacks. Um, but which by the way, like panic attacks are a, um, are, are, so there's this pathway in our body called the bore, uh, or pathway. There's this, um, the, 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 the pathway of delivering oxygen to our cells, which involves red blood cells and their hemoglobin content operates on this, um, universal principle in physics, wherein, uh, oxygen and carbon dioxide displace each other. So, and so, and our body, our body uses that physics in order to deliver oxygen to cells. And so if you ever have a, a, a significant discrepancy between the levels of oxygen or carbon dioxide, too much or too little, um, you actually can get um, anxiety because your cells start to become deprived of oxygen. And, um, and that's why like breathing exercises can help calm you down because that helps you to properly absorb or ventilate either carbon dioxide or oxygen so that your cells can become more properly, um, oxid uh, um, have access to oxygen. Um, but you can also be so metabolically ill that breathing exercises don't really work and you have to get your metabolic rate up. But like I talk about in my book, which is a really long process. We, we can't get into that right now. Um, but anyway, so trauma. So I, so I recognized that my parents' behavior and a lot of the uh, trauma that it caused me 
originated itself from their own experiences of trauma when they were children. So I realized that like the best way to just write my book about uh, about about trauma was in the context of parenting to first help adults resolve their own experiences of trauma, thereby teaching themselves new skills that they can then pass use in parenting and pass on to their own children, thereby eliminating intergenerational um, uh, trauma cycles. Um, so anyway, so in that context, um, I wanted to talk about what it's like, what trauma is and where it comes from and how we deal with it as, um, as adults and as children. Um, and kind of a little bit about how you, how you get over it. I can't, the reason I wrote a book about it is because it's very complex and it involves very specific steps and skills to teach you, which I, I can't do in just a stream. <laughs> Um, I mean, there's literal worksheets like you literally that's it's actually also actually so just straight up front, like the inventory therapy, it's really easy to do. All you have to do is sit down with a pad and a pen and, and a pen and write. You just have to be willing to do the writing work. And it's it's a structured a lot of people compare it to journaling, but and, and journaling kind of works in a similar way. Because one one of the reasons and one of the reasons that journaling or this like this inventory therapy actually works is because writing actually communicates with your subconscious. We cannot trauma is a, is something that affects our subconscious and you cannot willingly resolve it through conscious um uh willpower. Like you can't just will yourself not to be traumatized and that's what most of us do. We try to pretend that we're not traumatized or we try to act in spite of it as or do our best. But that does not resolve trauma because the trauma exists in your subconscious and writing actually communicates with your subconscious. So if you sit down and do journaling or the way that my therapy works is it's a structured writing practice that has, you know, it's an evolved version of what they teach you in AA. And one of the reasons why it works and why AA does work is because of this psychological therapy that helps you to uh, directly address and uh, confront and resolve your own experiences of trauma. And then the reason that it works is because as a writing practice, it directly communicates to your subconscious. So anyway, so um, I was at one of my um, siblings' houses a long time ago, and they have several children, and I um, noticed something that was really sad and, and, and tragic. And they're, they're, you know, they're, they're somebody who um, despises my work and me and, um, and we don't really have a relationship, but, um, while I was there, I noticed that like their whole family was there, but I noticed that none of them were making direct eye contact with anyone else. And I actually noticed this when I first, like I, I first moved back to Utah to be near my family which kind of turned out to be a mistake, but it was also actually the catalyst for like writing my second book. So I think it was like, you know, I think it was like karmically, like I was supposed to like go through that so that I could understand how to write my second book, even though it was a really unpleasant experience. <laughs> um, but I noticed like when I would first be around my nieces and nephews, like they would not make eye contact with me. Um, it was so weird. Um, cause like I'd have conversations with them and they'd just be like looking off in like, you know, a slightly different direction than myself. And you know what? I remember doing this too, as a child, I remember when I was a child, if I ever had to interact with somebody that I didn't like, I would not look them in the eye. I would literally look off their shoulder or in another direction. And I remember noticing that I would do that when I was a kid, but you know, obviously I had no idea what was going on or why I just thought I was like a bad person. <laughs> um, but I, and I noticed my nieces and nephews doing this, like when, when we would interact, they like would not make eye contact with me. And part of that is, you know, also is being a child and being insecure, you know, and, and adults are huge. And I mean, I'm at an enormous adult, I'm six foot seven. So like, I'm pretty intimidating, but children are really easy to get, um, to get, 
uh, to make eye contact with you, though. Like you can you can overcome that really quickly because they're young and hopeful and happy. Generally, even you know, even, kids are so resilient. Even when they live in horribly traumatic situations, they always are you know optimistic and hopeful and looking f- to the future. And they're very eager to make connections with other people because that's how we learn as children. We we have relationships and interactions with all kinds of people. It, ho- hopefully. Um, and, um, and because that's how we learn as a human species, we learn from other humans. And so when you, as a child, you instinctually seek out, um, relationships with, um, family members and, and friends, uh, because that's how we assimilate knowledge, uh, through experience. So, um, so I was very able, easily able to get my, um, nieces and nephews trust, um, even though I hadn't been in their lives before by literally just by making eye contact with them. So I like, when I was like, when I was like having conversations with them, I'd just be like, you know, making eye contact and they would look, they would notice that I was like making eye contact and then they would look away and I could tell they thought that was really weird because they don't get eye contact from the other adults in their lives. And, um, but very quickly, like they got used to it. And then when we would talk, then they would look at me and like, it was even really weird because like, I would like early on, like I would literally like, I had not seen them like, and like maybe, but once or twice, but I'd be over at their house and they would come home from school and they would not even acknowledge my presence. Like I'm six foot seven and I'm sitting there at the kitchen bar talking to their mother and they wouldn't even look at me, let alone say hi. And it was so strange because like, like it's not like they could miss me. They know, like I'm obviously there like, Oh, hi, uncle Nathan you know, kind of thing. So, but then, and then after, you know, after I kind of broke through that, um, that, that coping mechanism, um, then they would, and they would make, they would make eye contact with me. And, and we, we, you know, we got fairly close, but unfortunately that sister is not, um, not very nice. So anyway, um, but, um, you know, but I noticed, I noticed that this is how this is one of the mechanisms of action behind childhood trauma that is uh, so traumatic for us as children when we experience it. When parents are traumatized such that they cannot effectively handle interpersonal relationships, they um, can't actually like endure emotional intimacy with their own children. And one of the ways in which they avoid doing that is by cutting off eye contact. And that's one of the reasons why like none of my nieces and nephews here were actually making eye contact with each other was because they had been being raised in a home where the parents would actually avoid eye contact with their children in order to avoid emotional intimacy with them. Because their own trauma as parents is such that emotional intimacy is a threat, you know, rather than a benefit (laughs) of being a parent and family life. And so they actively destroy that mechanism by which parents should bond with their children, which is through like eye contact and intimate actions like eye contact. Um, So I was, you know, over there and noticing that they're like, just even though their entire family were all in the same room, none of them were interacting with each other. Um, There, two of them were, but for a reason I won't get into, because that's more of like a demographic thing. Um, uh, But, um, uh, but the, all the others were not. Um, and it was really sad. It was just like really sad. Like I don't have my, I don't have children of my own and I couldn't imagine having my children around and ignoring them. Um, but the reality of that is, is that trauma prevents us from doing these things and being effective. And one of the reasons I wanted to talk about trauma in context of being a parent is because parenting is what perpetuates trauma. Like it doesn't matter what your childhood was like as a parent, you are the person who facilitates or either protects your children from trauma, um, from child childhood trauma. And if you don't have the skills to do that, you will inevitably, um, cause trauma to your children, even when you're doing your best, because a lot of us, the way that we live our lives is actually colored by the trauma that we have gone through. And because we don't know how to recognize it or even what it is, let alone resolve it, you can't help but traumatize your own children because you're not even aware of how your own trauma affects your your lives. And so like examples of this are a lot of things like, like one very plain example of 
this is sex when it comes to sex. A lot of parents are traumatized when it comes to sex because their parents were also traumatized about sex and then adopt um, co coping mechanisms like prudishness or shame um, and fear and, and, and blame and body shaming and all that kind of stuff as a response to try to cope with the trauma that they experienced um, uh, 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 in terms of sex as children. Um, I can't tell you how many adult women of the baby boomer generation that have come to me for, um, for, for coaching who were actually raped by their own dads. It is a number that was far higher than I ever even thought could have been possible. And, you know, for people to go through those kinds of experiences and then be expected to be an effective parent is ridiculous. Like, I, and I talk about this in my book, like uh, there were times, even before I got good at this and knew what I was really doing, there were times when I would notice my siblings having a really hard time parenting and being very frustrated by it and then trying to help them. But because we were traumatized in a certain way as children to be conditioned to view any criticism as a threat, they would not be receptive to it. You know, nobody wants to hear that they're doing a bad job, right? But when it comes to being parents, like if you're not doing a good job, that means you're really fucking up your <laughs> your child. It's not like, it's not a victimless crime, right? There's like serious problems that are going on there. Um, but the other thing too is that parenting doesn't need to be as hard as it is. Oftentimes parenting is very, very difficult because being a parent triggers our trauma that is unresolved. So um, not only are we having to be responsible for another life to clothe them and feed them and protect them and educate them. Their presence also triggers all of this unresolved trauma in ourselves. And so the experience becomes really miserable and frustrating because we have to deal with our trauma and being a parent at the same time, you know, and being a childless gay guy, like I didn't have that burden of being a parent. So I was able to observe objectively what was going on in my family around me, um, also informed by my own experiences and to, was able to recognize why this was happening and how to empower my siblings, um, and my nieces and nephews, um, like how, uh, uh, how to resolve those problems and make the experience of parenting, of parenting much more, um, effective and enjoyable and rewarding, um, in the ones who aren't, so traumatized that they can't even listen to me, <laughs> uh, you know, cause some people just don't want to. And, uh, and, and, and one, and one of the other, one of the other reasons too, that prevents trauma from being resolved is that a lot of the times the coping and control mechanisms that we develop in response to our own experiences of trauma, um, help us to feel in control of our lives. So for instance, if you are a parent who was sexually abused as a child, when you become a parent, you oppositely think that controlling your children's sex lives will spare them the pain that you went through. But what actually ends up happening is that you just end up passing your own trauma onto them because they haven't had that trauma, right? Like you are the person that went through that trauma, but they, they have not yet or and hopefully never will. But you give them your trauma by passing it on through those control and coping mechanisms that you adopted in response to your own trauma. And so because we can have control, and another one, like one, I'll, I'll do one self-deprecating self one for myself. So like um, as a child, right, like one of my traumas as a child was not having fulfilling intimate relationships with my own family members. So when I became an adult and tried to create my own family um, and have romantic experiences, I would um, instinctually and reactively treat my partners as if it was inevitable that they were going to leave me, that they would never be around. And so I became this insufferable kind of control freak <laughs> who was insecure all the time and demanded attention and demonstrable um, D demonstrations of affection in order for me to feel okay. But the thing is, is that like the people that I were dating, like they were choosing to be there in my life. And that I could not see as a demonstration of affection, just the fact that they were choosing to be there because my own trauma uh, um, 
uh, my own unresolved trauma prevented me from seeing that kind of thing because the act of demanding attention and, um, and, and demonstrations of, of affection helped me to instead feel in control when I oppositely felt out of control. Um, so yeah, so, and you know, and then, and if you become a parent, when you have these, um, experiences of trauma, you can't help but traumatize your own children because your the 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 place that you are operating from is one informed by trauma, um, and because trauma is um, exists in the subconscious, which we cannot be actively conscious about usually, um, you're not even aware really of it. And so, um, uh, so one of the mechanisms of Traumatize, trauma, traumatizing experiences as a child are things like being cut off emotionally from your own parents, i.e. the uh, lack of eye contact, for instance. Um, but it's not just that, you know, it's also a dearth of hugs and kisses and, you know, my parents, my mom was really great about, like, she would scratch our backs a lot as children and, um, and well, but this is also an example of like how trauma, how, how your own unresolved trauma as a parent makes your job harder. So like we didn't, we did not get a lot of demonstrable affection from our parents, but my mother was willing to like scratch our backs if we asked. So we would like go, we would just, all of us, all six of us would hound my mother to scratch her back, our backs all the time because it was like one of the only instances of physical touch that we would even get from them. <laughs> so then my mom is having to like scratch all the backs of these children all the time, even when she doesn't want to. Because it's the only way that her children are getting what they need, you know, um, um, from a parent. So, like, growing up in a home where um, emotional intimacy is absent because of the trauma of the parents um, at question, uh, being a child in that kind of environment is extremely lonely. But you don't even know that it is because you've never been alive before. I mean, that we know of, you know. There could be reincarnation. I think it sounds like the most logical um, spiritual explanation of life. But, you know, but ostensibly, you know, for, for all intents and purposes, um, like we haven't been alive before. This is our first experience. We don't even know that we're lonely, even though we are abjectly lonely. So you grow up in a family where you don't have any emotional um, connection with anyone. You you aren't able to develop um, uh, very healthy, uh, s skills as a person learning to get to know who you are and how to deal with others. You're just completely cut off from everybody, you know, and it's not absolute, you know, we might find like relationships with friends or maybe that one relative that's actually emotionally available. Um, but generally like this is how, uh, and this is why a lot, a lot of the reason too, why people don't understand what a trauma is, is because, because your experience is your experience. You don't even know that it was trauma because you don't have anything to compare it to. But growing up in a home where your parents refuse to even make eye contact with you is trauma. But that's not a really overt trauma like we think of like where um, if you get sexually assaulted or hit as a child or bullied, like we think of those as trauma. But uh, but a lot of us have a trauma that is very severe um, but it comes from more subtle, mundane dynamics of the home life that we had, such as being denied um, emotional connection with our own parents. So you grow up as a child very lonely, and, um, and, and that cultivates, you know, feelings of despair and promotes depression. Um, okay, so one, okay, so one very specific example that's related to this that I talk about in my book Um is finger sucking and thumb sucking. Um, and, and, it, and it just drives me insane too, because a lot of the medical profession, um, talks about it in very dehumanizing ways. And, and this is about children. Like, I, like when I was doing research, um, on my book, um, seeing what like mainstream medical professionals, uh, how they talked about and characterized something like finger sucking, like literally they're like, they were like reputable, um, psychologists talking about it as, as it is, as if it is an addiction, like literally like 
two-year-olds talking about them like finger sucking is equal to using cocaine is fucking insane. Like, and it's no wonder child abuse is so rampant. Like, children sucking their fingers is not an addiction behavior. It is a trauma behavior. Um, specifically, the reason that is, is a, that it is um, a trauma, a reaction to trauma, is in evolutionary context of us as human beings. Uh, human children are completely unable to, uh, <laughs> you had to fire, fire your parents. Oh, I'm sorry, Mercy. Yeah, I did too. Um, it's a sad reality about life. Um, uh, uh, in evo in terms of evolution, human, young human beings are completely incapable of caring for themselves. Um, well, actually, individual human beings, we can't we can't actually survive on our own as human beings. We don't possess. We evolved as a species uh, strategically to uh, to exploit the power of the group uh, to promote our survival as a species. We are not fast. We don't have big claws or teeth. We don't have we we don't even have fur on our bodies to keep us warm. Every human being is abjectly dependent on every other human being in the world in order to survive. Now, there's really great, like, you know, survival YouTube channels that might make you think otherwise. But, like, like, like even humans that live alone in the woods are dependent on other humans not cutting down those woods so that they're there even in the first place. <laughs> in our especially in our contemporary societies but they'll even collect they'll take with them things that were made by other people they didn't they didn't forge those knives that they brought out with them you know the the pocket knives and the rope and all those things you know that they take out with them um but even like the ones what's like what's that one channel that's so great primitive technology or is that what his name is um that does those, all those really cool like makes his own ovens and stuff like that that is knowledge that has been handed down from generation to generation by other human beings on how to make fire on how to cook food on how to make pottery we don't fucking know those things on our own as human beings we are dependent on each other for our survival and that prospect is very threatening uh to lose so children are even worse in that regard they're smaller <laughs> they're slower they don't have the capacity we as children do not have the capacity to care for ourselves at all and are completely dependent on um uh, on adults um uh for our well-being um and one of the ways in which nature facilitates that is through instincts that we don't even realize that are instincts. Like the entire reason that a baby cries is so that your the parent will fucking know that it's there. <laughs> like adult human beings, if babies didn't cry, they would just die. Like they would literally just die. Like we wouldn't know when to feed them. Not not all of us. Some of us probably are really good enough parents that we could anticipate those needs. But But the reason that babies cry is so that the adults know that it's there at all. Like if babies didn't cry and they were just quiet, they would literally just get left behind and die. Like, you know, humans are, we're really dumb as a species. <laughs> we're very self-centered. We get distracted. We also suffer from mental illness and trauma of our own that prevents us from actually, you know, fulfilling those needs very often as a parent. So there are these instinctual mechanisms built into humanity biologically that are meant to perpetuate our survival as a species. And crying um, in children is a mechanism to get the adult to pay attention to the child, to help them on the adult, help the adult understand that the child needs something for its survival. One of those, you know, there's just the general, there's the general things like food in shelter. You know, if a baby isn't fed, they cry. If they get wet, like they're outside in the rain, they'll cry. You know, if they get hit, they'll cry. You know, there's there's all these um, stimuli in the environment that will actually inform that uh, that that evolutionary evolutionary adaptation to inform the parent of what is going on and what the child needs. One of the needs that we need as children is physical closeness and intimacy with our own parents, and that's not just an altruistic emotional love function. What it is is actually it's a safety mechanism. If if evolutionarily if evolutionary evolutionarily <laughs> as a child you were very 
physically distant from your parent, you are at greater risk of predation. Like literally you'll get picked off by a Pleistocene, um, I almost said woolly mammoth. <laughs> they're not, they're not carnivores. You might get stepped on one though. Um, you might um, get picked off by a Pleistocene saber tooth tiger or one of those giant eagles that used to live in the world. And there are, there's actually like, there's actually forensic archeological evidence of these enormous eagles uh, preying on um, baby human beings. Um, find, they found a uh, baby human being skull that was punctured by the enormous talon of a raptor, a pred, a, a, an avian raptor. Um, babies to survive needed to be literally touching and physically close to adult human beings who are bigger and can protect them. And the, and when that doesn't happen, the baby cries out of loneliness, but the loneliness, it's not an altruistic, like, I love you as you're my parent function. It's I'm literally going to get eaten by a wild animal if I'm not literally next to you and touching your skin. So a lot of times though, what happens, and, and so because as, as parents, as, as human adults, when we have unresolved trauma, that actually prevents us from being effective parents very often because the par the mere presence of our children annoys us or aggravates us. Um, or, and, and also I want to say real quick too, like I'm talking about parenting, but parenting and being a child is, is intrinsic to what trauma is. And that's one of the reasons why people don't understand trauma or how to resolve it is because they don't recognize that the parent child relationship is the very dynamic and our evolutionary strategies as a human being um, in the context of parenting and childhood is what creates trauma. And that's why, that's why, so it doesn't matter if you're not a parent, it doesn't fucking matter. You, like the, you were a child raised by parents. That's what we're talking about. Like, this is what trauma is. Um, so anyway, so don't check out if you're not a parent. <laughs> and then also, you know, everyone has the potential to be a parent pretty much. And so like, you know, so it's good to know these things anyway, but, but the whole point of knowing how the parent child relationship in biological human terms facilitates trauma is how you overcome it. So, and that's, so that's why I'm talking about it. Hang on. I need, I need some more coffee. Oh, so good. Okay. Um, so the so the the response of a child to lack of physical closeness with a parent is to be stressed. That's why they cry when they're lonely and afraid is because you touching them and picking them up tells their human brain that they're safe. That's the entire point. It's not, you know, to be lovey even though that's part of it. Um, it's safety. And when children and then as adults, if we have unresolved trauma that prevents us from effectively fulfilling that role, the act of finger sucking is a self soothing mechanism. And this might be part of the reason why like some psychologists and psychiatrists might compare it to, uh, addiction is because addiction and alcoholism is self-medication. And yes, a baby sucking their fingers or, or thumbs is self-medication. But then these traumatized, fucked up, abusive adults then tell you you need to break that habit. That only fucking causes more trauma because the reason that the child is sucking their thumb or finger in the first place is because they're traumatized. You can't force them to stop doing that. You need to fix the trauma that you caused. But because a lot of people, especially parents, get defensive about that kind of thing because of their own trauma, they then don't address it in the way that would actually fix it. They just double down and cause more trauma. <laughs> so like one of my siblings um, was notorious in our family for sucking her fingers. And my parents did everything they could to try to break her of her habit, except actually hold her and give her affection. They put mitten, they duct taped mittens to her hands. They put her, they put hot sauce on her fingers, which doesn't just like hot doing, putting hot sauce on, on, on a child's body should get you thrown in prison. Like that is such a traumatic thing to do to a child. Hot sauce does not just burn your tongue. It also can burn the actual skin when you put it on it. Like, you know, just because you're an adult who has less sensitive skin 
you know, it doesn't mean that like, it doesn't hurt a child. Like that is like literally physical abuse. Um, they would throw her in the garage at night when she wouldn't go to bed. Um, and also probably when she sucked her fingers, like they, they like, and, and the thing is, is it doesn't matter. Like the reason that parents get concerned when a child is sucking their fingers is not because it's bad for the child. It's because it is the child demonstrating um, vulner emotional vulnerability and neediness. And then the and then parents see that and we become insecure because we know that we have somehow failed. Like our child is sucking their finger or thumb because they need something that we're maybe necessarily not giving to them. And then because we are because of our own trauma, we're defensive and callous. And we refuse to um, show compassion to uh, to the child, um, uh, uh, become defensive and try to uh, force them to do it so that we don't have to witness it rather than it's not really doing anything wrong. Uh, it does not fuck up your dentition. Um, dentition problems as a child are created by um, dietary deficiencies of the fat soluble vitamins, carotene, vitamin A, vitamin E. Uh, vitamin K and vitamin D, which we get from sunlight, not from food. And, uh, but, but, but dentition is formed by those, um, fat soluble vitamins, um, because they're involved in endocrinological function and that helps to facilitate proper, um, organization of the body. Um, anyway, but, and that's a lot of deep technical science. I'm not going to get into right now, but, um, uh, finger sucking is not a problem. Parents get insecure, because they think, you know, other people, other parents are going to make fun of them or say something about their child sucking their finger. That is entirely an ego problem located or uh, relevant to the adult, not the child. And finger sucking and thumb sucking and blinky sucking, uh, there's nothing wrong with it. It is, it is a, it is a, it is a child performing self-soothing behaviors when they feel stress. And if that stress is caused by an absence of emotional and physical intimacy with their own parent, that is, you know, like a, like, like a, like a, 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 a sign that you need to like do more to fix that problem. Um, and like, um, somebody actually messaged me, um, not too long ago, um, and said that they, they'd read my second book. They, but they forgot exactly what I said about finger sucking and that their child was doing it a lot. And I, and my specific reply to them was all you need to do is double or triple the amount of hugs, kisses, and eye contact that you're giving to them and it will stop. And it did. And it does because the finger sucking and thumb sucking is a self soothing, um, uh, uh, Strat coping strategy for children to deal with the stress of not being near their parent. So, um, this kind of talk, uh, plays into the, well, uh, the way that this segues in my book too, actually, which is what I'm going to do now is that the, the, this, this, this phenomenon of parents, um, being unable to meet their obligations as parents, which causes a lot of problems in children, which makes parenting more stressful, is ultimately a lack of self-care and self-compassion for themselves. And that also ultimately is the problem behind all trauma. All trauma uh, continues to be trauma because we don't know how to have compassion for ourselves. And we don't know how to do self-care because we have not been given those skills. People talk about having skills, right? Like, you know, you're a good lawyer or, you know, like you're a good orator or a good writer or you're a good friend or a good listener. But in fact, there are also skills that are purely mental and emotional. Um, for instance, even knowing how to have compassion for yourself is a skill. But guess what? If your parents did not have that, as a skill to teach you. And unless you had opportunity to learn it from somebody else in your childhood, you likely also lack the ability to show yourself compassion. And, um, like, right. Like any of you, uh, that are listening right now, like, like what, 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 how do you think, like, what does it look like to show compassion for yourself? Like, you know, do you think it's like, you know, going for some ice cream? 
you know, or is it like going to the gym and like working yourself to death? Is it like, is it like starving yourself to like, you know, get skinny so that you're fit? Like, like our ideas about compat what compassion for ourselves um, looks like is a skill. And a lot of us don't have it. And that's one of the reasons why our trauma continues to perpetuate in our lives and continues to cause us problems is because no compassion was shown to you as a child. You don't know what it looks like. So you can't give it to yourself as an adult. And this is a lot of what I did as an adult in response to my own trauma and abuse as a child. Um, that caused me a lot of problems was because I did not know what compassion for myself looked like because none was ever shown to me. Um, I did not show it to myself as an adult. So a lot of my trauma resulted in um, problems like body dysmorphia, you know, hating my body, even though like I was gorgeous, <laughs> like, you know, depression, loneliness. Um, and I would, you know, and I would try to counteract those insecurities in the way that a lot of us do, which actually is not effective for resolving trauma. So, but let, so, so for instance, if I had trauma around finances, if I like was scared of like, um, being financially insolvent or having financial stress and I would, um, I, I would respond to that fear by trying to get a really good job, trying to get my pay up, you know, trying to work really hard so that people would like, you know, my bosses would notice me and they'd give me a better raise. But you know what? A lot of them wouldn't even give me raises. Those fucking baby boomers who were, you know, paid really great wages as when they were young refused to pay that forward and exploited their children instead of um, giving them um, like the benefits. Like, like my profession, I was a 3D motion graphics um, director. Um, the equivalent position, uh, 20, even just 20 years ago would have paid at least a hundred thousand dollars more a year than what I was being paid. Um, and you know, and this on top of those industries making even more profit than they even did back then. Um, you know, uh, uh, oftentimes the things that we do to handle our insecurities, um, are control and coping mechanisms that are born of trauma and one of the reasons they don't work to give us satisfaction or to resolve our problems is because they don't resolve the underlying trauma. It's a coping mechanism or a, or a, a control mechanisms are also coping mechanisms. Um, and, and we, we employ these to deal with and handle the insecurity, but they don't resolve the underlying trauma. And so you never actually get better. This is the classic reason why, you know, the pursuit of money doesn't solve the problems that everyone who's doing it thinks it's going to. Every People who are insecure about finances, who want to be rich, who want to be successful, think that being rich and successful is going to solve all their problems. Oh, if I could just have that really, you know, fucking awesome car or buy a really big house, everything would be fine. And then these people get those really big cars and they get into those really big houses and they become even worse they are abusers and narcissists and, and, and opportunistic because those are just control and coping mechanisms to the trauma that we have. They don't do anything to actually resolve it. Like literally fucking like you literally think if someone gives you a million dollars, is that going to, um, you know, resolve the sexual abuse that you went through as a child? Like, no. Like th that doesn't – or if your dad like constantly disapproved of you and told you what a miserable – person you were that a million dollars is going to somehow fix that. <laughs> like, no, of course it's not. And that's why it doesn't. And that's why the pursuit of those things, like I, I coach people all the time who like, you know, I, I have to, I, I it, it often doesn't work because it's really hard to get through. Like people just do not understand that like being a success is not going to solve your depression and your anxiety and your self-hatred because a lack of success or money was not the thing that caused those problems in the first place. The thing that caused those problems in the first place was your experience growing up and the um, information that you were given about who you are and about what the world is like, whether it was real or not, served to traumatize you. And those things are not being addressed by pursuing success and money and 
you know, power and, and stuff like that. Those are just things to try to help us feel more in control of our environment, which I run, which is also an irony because we actually can't control our environments. And a lot of people have a really hard time accepting that. Um, we can't prevent ourselves from dying. Um, we can't actually prevent people from leaving us. We actually can't um, make sure our children turn out to be, um, you know, incredible successes. None of these things are actually in our control. You can contract a disease and die. You can get hit by a car. You can get shot. You know, you can get cancer. Um, you know, uh, your children can get cancer. Um, one of one of the reasons one of the reasons that trauma in parenting, and I don't mean caused by parents, but but parents that have unresolved trauma is so destructive is because it amplifies fears that naturally are present when you are a parent. Um, you know, having responsibility for a child that is also mortal and could die, um, you know, you could be, you, you become incredibly attached to them in spite of your best efforts, but they can still get shot at school or they can get COVID or RSV virus. Um, uh, what is that one? It's, respiratory something virus. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, they can like, and n any number of things and they get kidnapped and, and, you know, and any of you that are parents and listening to this are probably having, you know, the hair on the back of your neck is probably standing up from hearing that because those things are very awful, but they do and can happen. And even in our best efforts, sometimes we can't prevent those things from happening. That's the entire point of being mortal is we are not omnipotent. We don't have control, but that can be very scary because you don't have the skills to handle those realities of life. So then you try to um, use coping and control mechanisms to handle that fear. And then those, co but then those coping and control mechanisms end up preventing you from having a healthy, uh, fulfilling relationship with your own children and then that causes abuse and trauma in your children, even though you didn't mean to do it, it still happens. And then we get trauma as children when we grow up. And then and then we and then we become parents and repeat the cycle. So um okay. So we have trauma as children. Things happen to us. We had um um they they affected like okay, so one so one of the major effects of trauma that's um, really important or really impactful on our lives is that, <coughs> excuse me, trauma, um, well, our, our entire experience growing up uh, forms our perspective and opinion of our, and conception of ourselves and also the world in which we live in. And if there's a lot of trauma in that, your opinion of yourself as an adult can be very negative. Um, or, and unhelpful and ineffective as well. And you can also grow up and be completely terrified of the world and the people in it. Um, you know, having been uh, a young gay boy raised in a abusive conservative community, when I became an adult, I was terrified of everybody. Uh, I thought my safety was always in jeopardy, which sometimes it was. Um, and I thought that I was a terrible person because I was gay and I tried, you know, I tried so much to not be gay <laughs> as a kid and it doesn't work that way. Also, it's one of the real ironies, like, you know, this kind of trauma that comes from like, especially from like religious backgrounds, like I prayed daily for God to make me straight. And guess what? God gave me an answer his answer was no, <laughs> but that wasn't good enough because my bigoted conservative community wanted me to be straight and said that being gay was bad. But I prayed daily to not be gay. And God answered that question by saying, Nope, you you're going to stay gay. That's, you know, how I made you. <laughs> so like, you know, we're not even willing to listen to the answers that the universe um, sends our way because our trauma um, prevents us from experiencing that. Um, you know, and that's one of the, and, and, and so, and, 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 and because our perception of ourselves and our life and the world around us is, um, constructed from trauma that then in turns, um, informs our actions and our life experiences. So, and so here's an example of like, 
um, okay, okay, actually, actually, okay, no, I'm gonna, I'll tell about somebody else. So I was coaching somebody, a young, a really wonderful young man, also, by the way, very gorgeous, um, was in a relationship with a very toxic girl who was abusive and exploitative. And, you know, a lot of us can get into relationships like this. We can be with somebody who is terrible, to, or, we, or we know people who are in relationships with people who are terrible to us, but don't leave them. We don't get out of the relationship and we put up, we put up and persist with that abuse. Um, and, um, uh, mo mo and so people will try to be helpful, like, and blame that person for being in the relationship, but then that's not helpful because that's not really the reason that they're doing it in the first place. Um, the people who are in those relationships can genuinely love each other, but, because they do not have effective interpersonal skills are not able to effectively exist within or maintain that relationship. <clears throat> and it just devolves into chaos and abuse and trauma and hate and resentment. And eventually they might fall apart, but people can persist in those relationships, you know, for decades, they can be like in these like abusive, <laughs> you know, uh, cycles of recrimination and until they die. And then after they die, they, Oh, I loved my husband so much, but the whole time that, you know, they, they spent hating each other and doing horrible things to each other. And it's just ridiculous. And that's a direct um, consequence of trauma because number one, because we do not affect we do not possess effective interpersonal or self-care skills. Number two, the reason that this occurs is because your perception of yourself and the world around you has been informed such from your experiences of trauma that you're not even able to recognize that you can get out of those situations. So like my, um, one of my relationships in which my partner asked me to marry him at one point, um, was, um, a, just a site of abuse cycle, uh, me yelling at him and him yelling at me and us having just a generally, um, uh, volatile relationship, but we had a lot of fun and I really, really loved him. Um, but he asked me to marry him about two years before we broke up actually. Um, and, um, and you know, we did, we, we never really even firmly set a date or even really seriously talked about it. And one of the reasons I didn't uh, like set a date and push for it was because I was really insecure about my appearance because unknown at the time I was developing cancer and I was gaining weight and I just looked really bad. And I, I wanted to like re look really good for my, for my wedding. So I like, I just kept putting it off thinking that my exercising and dieting was eventually going to pay off, but it just kept getting worse and worse. And then before I knew it, two years had passed and but then I heard later from people that he was telling people that he stopped loving me like two years before we broke up, which is exactly when he asked me to marry him <laughs> and that he only asked me to marry him because he thought it would change me. Like how fucked up is that? Like you don't even like somebody, but you ask them to marry you like just fucking go somewhere else, like leave, like go leave. Just leave. And he did. I would like I would break up with him because I could tell he didn't like me. And then he would come crying back to me and beg me to take him back. And I didn't understand what was going on because I knew he didn't like me. But I but then he would tell me that I was the most important thing to him and that he loved me so much and he wanted to be in a relationship with me. It was so confusing. And what I ended up realizing later, um, you know, in the process of like writing this second book about trauma was that the reason he was asking me, he would ask me to take him back was because he did not want to be the bad guy. Like he did not want to be the person that broke up with me. He just wanted it to, he wanted our relationship to break up, but he didn't want to be the responsible party for that. Um, and this is also another, the other side of the coin of being in a relationship with um, someone who doesn't like us and is abusive to us is also being um, in a relationship with somebody that you don't like and are abusive to. And a lot of, and, and a lot of the times like we will avoid, um, we don't, we, we don't break up with them because we don't want to be mean to them. And this is a direct result. This kind of behavior is actually a direct result of unintentional abuse by our parents when we were children. So for instance, when you're a child, and you want or need something and your parents don't want to um 
get, don't want to or can't give it to you, they will like they will tell you that like you're um uh wrong for asking or for doing that. Like they'll say that you're at fault here. Um, say for instance, like you know you wanted to spend some time with your dad. And he said, and he said, I can't, I'm busy. And then you get mad and you get upset and you throw a fit. Right. Um, and, and then he gets even more mad at you and like, you're a bad kid and you're going to be punished and blah, blah, blah. We basically get told that. Um, oh, but even if it's not that, like even asking to spend time with your dad sounds a little bit self self-centered, right. On the part of the kid, even though they're kids, like they should, it's fine for them to be self-centered. Um, even more innocuous things, like if you're hungry and your parents don't feel like cooking for you, they'll tell you to stop whining and to shut up and like go to your room, you know, and they'll punish you for your needs that you have. So then you become conditioned, and but it's even more insidious when parents are actually abusive, when they hurt you and you and you respond in a negative way, like crying or telling them to stop or, or, you know, I hate you. Like you're such a bad parent, but it's because they're like, literally like they're literally abusing you, like denying you, um, relationships with friends or keeping or, or cutting you off from the family as a, as a manipulation tactic, you get trained to stop asking for what you need and being told that, um, asking for what you need, uh, even letting, even, even hinting at what you need is a bad thing to do. And that you're a bad person for doing that. So then you get in, into being an adult, an adult and you've been traumatized into not taking care of your own needs. And you get into a relationship with somebody and you learn, um, you know, early or late, however it happens that you're not actually into that person you don't end the relationship because you've been so traumatized into uh, neglecting your own needs that you live with somebody that you don't even like for years or decades just because you don't want to be mean to them. <laughs> because when you were quote unquote mean as a child, you got spanked for it or told that you were a bad person or got cut off from your parents. And so then as an adult, you don't, say what you need or ask for what you need and you end up hurting both yourself and other people and then you also understand too once at some point that like you you know that you're hurting um somebody else when you're in a relationship like that and that makes you feel even more guilty but the fact is is that it's extremely destructive and selfish to exist in a relationship that you don't want to be in just because you don't want to be the mean person it's actually much meaner meaner to be doing that than it is to just let them go and, you know, if my, if my ex had just said, Hey, this isn't working out. I know I like, let's just go, go date other people. And it was nice having a relationship with you. We could have fucking saved two years of heartache and, um, and emotional volatility and all the pain and destruction that it caused, you know, and he could have just gone and fucked a whole bunch of people like he wanted to do. And I could have moved on and, and met somebody that actually cared for me. Although I wouldn't have done that because I hadn't at that point yet resolved the trauma that I'm talking about right now, because I had not yet learned the skills to care for my well-being, which were impaired because of the trauma that I went through. I probably would have just jumped to, um, you know, be in a relationship with somebody else, um, you know, uh, really quick, uh, just like that. And I actually started to recognize that too. When I, when I started doing inventory therapy and I started getting better, I started recognizing my own patterns of the people that I dated, how they were a certain type of person that was vulnerable to my control mechanisms. And, but what I was getting out of that were people who were also controlling because you cannot get into a relationship with a healthy person if you yourself are demonstrating and exhibiting control behaviors. And so trauma can actually direct our lives into ways that we do not want to be in. and But we can't even be aware of it because it's almost impossible to be aware of your own unconscious, subconscious and the trauma that uh, resides in there. So for instance, a lot of us end up with people who are abusive or beneath us or, you know, kinds of people we don't even want to be in a relationship with because the people that you do want to be in a relationship with 
will not respond to your control behaviors and coping behaviors that are a result of the trauma that you experienced as a child and growing up. And it's really harsh and cruel, but it's also logical. Like as an adult, like I don't want to be in a relationship with somebody who's needy and possessive, right? I shouldn't have to do that either. Like I have every right to want to be in a relationship with somebody that is mentally healthy and who cares for me as much as they care for themselves or also vice versa cares for themselves as much as they care for me. Um, You know, I don't need to take on a charity project with somebody that needs a lot of work, right? But when we have unresolved trauma, that actually directs our lives and puts us on paths and among other people who are susceptible to our control mechanisms and coping mechanisms as a result of our trauma. So it actually physically limits your options in life and not just romance either in, in terms of like economic success and business success. Um, you know, uh, a lot of, uh, employers that I worked for growing up were like really opportunistic and they were probably like, and I didn't have a degree, like I didn't have a college degree, even though I was, I was really good at my job. I didn't have a college degree and I would just get handle handily rejected by like anyone who had an HR department. But a lot of companies that didn't really have an HR department that were run by like narcissists who were like control freaks, like would hire me because I was willing to take a job at a place that did that because of my own insecurities and desires for control and, um, and, and, and stuff and, 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 and wouldn't even get those opportunities because of how my control mechanisms resulting from my own trauma directed my life. Um, but you know, romance is really important to a lot of people. And like one of the reasons, um, hang on, close that curtain. The sun's getting in my eyes. Um, like one of the reasons that I just could not actually like, you know, like my, my fantasy man was like somebody who was like, you know, funny and quiet and soft-spoken and would, you know, talk to me in bed and, you know, and, and be interested in me. Um, I rejected those guys all the time because I, I didn't know that I was, but they were, they just didn't fit my, um, fit into my control mechanisms. For instance, like one, like romantically, like one of my control mechanisms was that people I was attracted to were usually, um, very, uh, Um, what's the word, um, like demonstrable in their affection toward me, like their interest, like they would fawn over me. They just be very effusive in their, um, interests. And and that would just land me hook, line and sinker. But the reason that it was that that would work on me and I wasn't interested in guys that were just kind of chill about romance was because I was so insecure about my about myself as a person and my value as a person because of the trauma that I went through as a child that their attention and their the extremes and the um, drama that they would that would happen from their interests would played directly into my lack of self-esteem and lack of self-worth, which, you know, in turn originated from my trauma. So I was never, ever going to even be able to find a person who was loyal and dedicated and kind and cared about me because I was only responding to guys that were um, flamboyant and charismatic. And then the problem comes that most men and women too, who are charismatic, um, are narcissists <laughs> and that's why they effuse over you. Um, and women, you know, have this problem a lot more than men do, although men do as well, because women are so much more objectified very often and expect and, and really just often considered as vessels for sex rather than an actual person. And so men like will see a really beautiful woman and just be completely devastated by her beauty but they don't consider who she is inside and they'll, and they usually will project their dream of a perfect, perfect woman on top of her physical shell. And like, that's what was happening to me because I was responsive to narcissists because of my own unresolved trauma. 
I was getting men who were just projecting their ideal of a person onto me and completely disregarding who I was as a person. I mean, and this would, you know, this would manifest in um, instances such as like, um, for instance, if like, like I hadn't even been dating somebody for very long, but there'd come a point when like they would get out their cell phone and like, <laughs> and like, and like start ignoring me. And I was like, God, I'm really boring. And I mean, I am boring. Like I really am boring, but like, but that wasn't why they were doing it. They were doing it because they were starting to get to know me and to get to know me as a person would actually destroy their fantasy of me as a person, regardless of what I was like. Because, and they didn't want to destroy that fantasy, so then they would just check out and not actually get to know me very deeply. So even though this guy asked me to marry him, like he didn't know anything about who I was, um, you know, two, four years into our relationship. Um, and it was and it was because he did not want to break that fantasy. Um, and he ended up marrying this gnome of a person and which is like, you know, his complaints about me were that I was fat and that I didn't make a lot of money. And then he married somebody who was fat and didn't make a lot of money. <laughs> and like, you know, like hit the, the problem was it was because his fantasy of who I was, was destroyed um, because he started to get to know who I really was as a person. And, but the whole reason I was susceptible to that in the first place was because of my own unresolved trauma, which made me susceptible to, um, control mechanisms, which preyed upon my sense of self-worth. So our experiences, it's very, very important to recognize and resolve your own trauma if you want to have more successful experiences in life, because your trauma directs your actions and your decisions and how you respond to your environment. And if you don't resolve that trauma, then you do things that waste your time and waste your energy and waste your resources um, because they are motivated from insecurity and trauma and not because um, you're actually taking care of yourself. Okay, so I've been rambling a lot about like, um, about like, uh, origins of trauma. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about like, what trauma looks like. Um, mercy, there is no failure like success, it seems, if you aren't conscious of trauma. Uh, success as a coping strategy can take you a long way until it can. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, well, uh, that's, you know, it's one of the ironies though, like success never ever is a like money and, um, success and, um, um, well, you know, actually, okay, actually, 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 like, like one of the other reasons, um, that we pursue money and success. Remember early in the, earlier in the stream, like a long time ago <laughs> when I was talking about, Jesus Christ, I can't believe it's almost been two hours already. Um, uh, remember when I was talking about um, how we as human beings need other human beings for our own welfare and our success and our ability to survive? The pursuit of money and success is just to facilitate other relationships with other people. If you get rich, people will like you. If you are successful in business, people will like you. But the thing is, the thing is, is that's a superficial source of, 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 um, of relating to other people, because if you're not rich, then those people aren't going to like you. And if you're not successful, then those people aren't going to like you. So that's why when you have failures as a rich, successful person, you also lose a lot of relationships because a lot of those people only ever wanted to be friends with you or like you because you had money in the first place. But that's exactly also why you were trying to earn that money and get that success is because you're insecure and traumatized and you and you know instinctually that having resources will draw other people to you because you don't have the balls to actually just ask people to be friends. <laughs> and and the reason we don't have the balls to do that is because of the trauma that we went through as children that it remains unresolved because we don't have the tools or the skills to resolve that trauma. Um, so yeah, so uh, money and success is and of itself a coping mechanism to the trauma. And if you were taught as a child that people are to be distrusted and disliked and feared, that is trauma that you're trying to resolve by earning money. But all that's going to do is facilitate that trauma, not resolve it because you're acting on that trauma, not um, resolving the trauma. Um, 
Yeah, Mercy, you felt unable to be mean because you didn't want to act towards anyone like your parents did to abandon them by seeming selfish. Yeah, it's actually more selfish to indulge that insecurity than it is to be humble and free the person from your own control mechanisms. And I'm saying that because I did that. <coughs> I would um, accept my ex back in spite of his heinous behavior toward me because I wanted to fulfill my own in selfish insecurity and desire to be loved and needed. And um, um, even though I didn't like him, <laughs> I mean, I did like him. I loved him, but I didn't even, I didn't realize I loved him until we broke up, but like he was such an asshole to me and did horrible things. But when we were breaking up too, was also at the time when I had this epiphany of like that I was an alcoholic, that I was treating people terribly because I was selfish and had all of this unresolved trauma. And that in turn made me have a lot more compassion for him and stopped resenting him for all of the things that he had done to me, which opened up my realization that I did actually care for him a very great deal. Um, but it was way too late. Um, so, um, so, so yeah, so, so, so unresolved trauma can direct your lives in exactly the opposite way than you want. And you can find yourself, you know, in 20 years into a relationship with somebody that you don't even like, just because you're of your, uh, your, because you are entertaining the trauma that you went through as a child that makes you feel insecure about letting somebody off the hook of a relationship with you. But also it prevents you from getting to know that person in the first place. So you can even be hating somebody because you never even got to know them because you're so afraid of emotional intimacy because of the trauma of rejection that you went through as a child. And so it's like this really complex psychological pathway that can only be addressed by doing structured compassionate self-care through practices like the inventory therapy in my book. And I talk about the ther ther inventory therapy in my book because it is mine. I made it, but I mean, it originated from Alcoholics Anonymous, but I fixed it and made it better and more effective. Um, but it, it's so, it, it's so easy to do. Like you literally, I mean, it's not, it's not like so easy. Like you do have to sort of overcome your own ego to do it. And a lot of people refuse to do it because uh, they don't want to let go of control and coping mechanisms. Um, but literally all you do is sit down and write, um, do structured writing. You don't have to do anything else beyond that. You don't have to change your mindset. You know, that, 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 that's one of the reasons why like that, that kind of advice is so stupid and ineffective and doesn't work is because you cannot resolve trauma just through willpower. You cannot will yourself to be better. And, but that's what we all try to do because that's the only skill that we were ever taught to just try to do better, but it does not work because the trauma is in your unconscious mind and you have to communicate with that unconscious mind and that can happen through writing practices. And then the inventory therapy is structured such that, um, I mean, it's a structured writing therapy. So it's, it's much more targeted, much more effective. Um, okay. There was my list of things I was talking about. Um, oh, one of the reasons I wanted to talk about this you did 20 years in a codependent art dance. Oh, yeah. Uh, was critical for me to understand my part and freed me to rebuild. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. Actually, that speaks that speaks to a big barrier to resolving trauma is because the trauma that you went through as a child also prevents you from um, accepting your part in your responsibility in your life and behavior because as a child you were taught that you were a bad child and you were regarded as trash and you know made to feel really horrible about yourself you as adults we try to do everything opposite of confirming that we want to like we want to believe that we're good people and that we're worth loving and guess what you are but not because you're pretending that you're flawless right <laughs> and like one of the reasons that i couldn't get myself out of it was because i lacked the skills to take responsibility for my own actions and behavior because doing that threatened my ego and seemed to, ju to justify all the reasons that I was abused in the first place as a child and rejected and neglected. And, you know, and especially if you get into a relationship with somebody that all the time, they just tell you what a loser you are. 
you know, then accepting your responsibility in that seems to give them more power. And that, but that's exactly what you're afraid of is letting go of control by admitting your own mistakes. But in fact, there's a great deal of power in doing that. And when you can learn the skills to do that in an effective way, that's when you actually get real control over your life, not by trying to control other people or outcomes, but only through your responses. And then you can more greatly affect your own experience. Um, <clears throat> so one of the reasons I want to talk about this too is because somebody on one of, um, so like, you know, on this video, on the comments, you know, you guys can tell me future subjects you want me to talk about, stuff like that. Somebody mentioned they wanted me to talk about social media and like detoxing from social media and like, or the problems of social media. And I've actually come across this quite a bit in people that I'm coaching when we're, when I'm coaching them on inventory therapy. Um, and by the way, self promotion. Um, I mean, this entire video is a self promotion, but like, um, there's a, you know, I have a coaching option where like I teach specifically walk you through and teach you the trauma, the inventory therapy. Um, it's helpful if you've read the book, um, it's in both of my books, but, the perfect child is more directly focused on abuse and childhood trauma. Um, if you start it yourself, I, and then I can like, and then it's more effective than I can, but I, I do offer that. I like t teaching people this as well. Um, so, uh, but I do very often come across things like social media and video game issues with people that I work with. And it's really funny because nobody really understands themselves and why these things are happening. So for instance, like someone will ask me that like, Hey, they're addicted to social media and they find themselves getting distracted when they are trying to work on a project. Um, so like, um, this one person that I was working with was like trying to focus on work and their ambitions and goals and would just get distracted and like get lost on social media. And my ex would do this too. My ex was a writer and had a, ha actually had a book deal and, um, you know, on completing the book, he would get like 20 grand. Like that's a huge motivation. And I just could not understand like why he couldn't just fucking write the book. <laughs> and he would get on like Facebook or Instagram and I'd be like, why are you on Facebook or Instagram? You're like, you know, I thought you were working. He's like, this is work. Because <laughs> he thought he was a personality, right? So, um, uh, but um, uh, the whole idea of having a problem with social media is a demonstration of trauma and a lack of self-compassion and a lacking compassion for yourself is at the heart of every trauma in, and self-destructive behavior that you think you do. So people who get mad at themselves for um, skipping their cheat day or for eating too much, you know, or for maybe not going to the gym or feel bad about spending too much time on social media or maybe not calling friends back. Like you feel, or like, yeah, like if, like if somebody calls you and wants to like have a, cat, a chat with you and you don't feel like it, so you like lie or like, you know, um, or, or, uh, or um, ignore or don't even pick up. All of that demonstrates an absence of compassion for yourself and the reason you need those things. And that is at the heart of trauma and its effects on our lives. And that's also why people don't recognize it as trauma because social media is very often discussed in negative terms, either addiction or the, you know, the negativity that's there or, you know, the depression that you might feel if you like get wrapped up in news and politics and all this kind of stuff. Um, there is nothing wrong with being on social media or playing a lot of video games. The reason that those things are happening is because you have unmet needs and you are trying to meet those needs any way that you can. So as human beings, like I've mentioned several times throughout this very long <laughs> stream, Jesus Christ, uh, is that as we need other human beings in order to uh, be fulfilled in life. And the, unfortunately, though, the way that our societies are currently set up with a lot of traumatized adults and uh, car-centric cultures where you don't even, you, you know, in your entire commute to work, you don't even run into a single person. Um, 
I don't mean run into like, you know, cause you can run into somebody in a car, but that's the wrong kind of running into, <laughs> you know, like, like we don't meet, like, like I live in a city that has a light rail transit and I use it. I live right on the line and I go places and I talk to people and I have conversations with strangers and it's so fulfilling, especially for someone who doesn't really have a lot of friends or family relationships. Um, uh, human being as human beings we used to live in very tight-knit groups where there was a lot of people a whole range of ages you know from children to adults and everyone in between and like as a young person you could easily make friends and find romantic interests and and, get, and learn from older adults and get insight and 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 you know and 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 develop as a human being and a lot a lot of that is denied us as human beings nowadays, because of our work centric cultures, because of our car centric cultures, because the literally because the infrastructure in our cities is designed such to keep people apart and prevents you from uh, me even just literally interacting and communicating and meeting people that live in your area. So, you know, so like wanting to be on so social media is a really great way to fulfill those deficits. That's one of the reasons why, I mean, I, I engage in social media a lot. I love the, a lot of the streamers that I listen to. I would not hear a human voice my entire day if I did not have those streamers to listen to. Um, you know, and that's separate from like TV where it's like acting and stuff like that, you know, streamers open themselves up to their audience and interact with them and you can, and you can, and you can be informed and get news and, you know, get involved in gossip and, you know, drama. And so it provides, so like social media is use is actually fulfilling a lot of needs that would normally be met by a healthy society that we don't have access to. And it's one of the really encouraging things about our generation and the younger generations that are coming up is there's there is this in there is this intuitive recognition of these deficits. And so, um, you know, a lot of people are starting to put in bike lanes in cities and put in light rail and put in better housing density and rejecting the suburban life because the suburbs are so fucking lonely. I mean, literally, like my one of my sisters interacts with all these moms that do babysitting duty and thinks that those are her friends. Those aren't your fucking friends. You don't talk to them except for when you guys are exchanging babysitting duties. That is not what a friendship is. But because we were raised by traumatized and abusive parents, we don't know these things. And that's why parenting is so hard. And that's why resolving trauma is so hard. And being able to even recognize trauma is so hard to do because our society is just being run by people who are abused and traumatized and, and, and reaching for alcohol and money and success and political power and divisiveness in order to assuage those traumas. But the problem is that that does not work because you have to resolve the trauma, not entertain it. So like, um, yeah. So like social media or like, you know, playing a video game, like if you, you know, like I was coaching somebody who um, felt really bad that they would play like four to six hours of league um, uh, when, and they felt like they should be more productive. And I'm like, I'm like, I like, like I wrote, I wrote two books. I've written over probably like 600,000 words just for these two projects alone. And I also play video games <laughs> because, you know, because, because just working all the time is so fucking lonely. Hey, 909. It's so fucking lonely. As human beings, we need interaction with others. And if you're not getting that from your environment, it's just, it's totally fine to get it from social media and interacting with people and video games and all that stuff. Like you are, that is actually self-care. If you're doing it obsessively, that just is an indicator of how much you're lacking in your life. It's not, you don't need to will yourself out of social media, quote unquote, addiction or game addiction or whatever. You need to fulfill yourself um, in ways that you're not. And oftentimes that's things like rom relationships, not romantic necessarily, although that can, but like actual friendships, you know, um, I was talking with somebody the other day that I was coaching and they, um, I've been helping them, um, try to cultivate, um, self, a good self image, right? 
um, because a lot of the reasons they were susceptible to abusive relationships and um, and, and isolation and loneliness was because they did not have a very good conception of themselves, even though they are a wonderful per person. Um, and part of that is like, you know, building relationships if you can. Unfortunately, a lot of times it's really hard to because um, you um, – you know, a relationship, unfortunately, requires both people to um, grow and be invested in it. And, um, you know, for instance, like I had a relationship with one of my sisters until her husband demanded that she cut me off because I'm gay and um, and she was starting to question her religion. And, you know, and so like I don't have a lot of control over that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, unfortunately, we have those barriers. But like, for instance, so this person like um, – offered to help this other person move um because they had a truck but that wasn't really the reason they offered to help them move they offered to help this person move because they liked that person it wasn't because they had a truck or because that person even needed to move it was because they liked that person and wanted to be part of the relationship with that person but oftentimes we won't even admit those things because we're so scared of rejection and we're so traumatized by our uh, experiences growing up and our lack of self-esteem that we don't even admit to the things we need. There was another person that I was coaching a while ago who unfortunately it didn't work. Um, uh, I kept asking them why it hurt when their partner said or did things to them that were awful. And they would just repeat back to me because they're awful or rude. I'm like, no, that is not the reason that it hurts you. What is the reason that it hurts you? And they would just think and they'd be like, because it's rude. And no, you just said that. <laughs> that is not why it hurts you. Why does it hurt you when someone you love hurts you? And I had to end up telling them that it was because they loved that person. They could not even admit that they loved that person because they were so insecure about giving up control because they were so traumatized as a child and did not believe that they were worth loving. So we try. So anyway, um, like, like, like cultivating relationships, like letting people know that you like them, that you want to be in a relationship with them. When you go help somebody or you offer yourself time, you know, with somebody, you're not doing it because you're nice. You're doing it because you want to have a relationship with that person, right? <laughs> and that's, and that is what you should, what we should be doing. Like, it is okay to need other people. It's great that we need other people. And you can offer yourself up for those opportunities. Unfortunately, they don't always pan out, but you can't um, guard yourself against rejection. And this comes into, and Jesus fucking Christ, it's two hours. I didn't even think this would take an hour. I'm not even all the way through my list. Okay, so this plays into like another aspect of trauma I wanted to talk to, which are people that identify as incels or and people that have a hard time finding romantic relationships. So... Remember, so like through a lot of my, a lot of the podcast so far, I've talked about how trauma directs our life and our choices because it constructs our perception of ourselves and the world around us. And your entire perception of life and the people in it is a result of your experience as a child because that's all you know. That's how you were raised, right? Like you were, you know, if you were raised as a child, like, um, uh, to believe that unicorns exist as an adult, you would like believe that unicorns exist until you like, you know, open a book and like find out that they don't. <laughs> it's the same thing with our perceptions of other people and our self-worth and our value. Um, um, our perception of the world around us can be colored so much by our trauma that we don't even actively, effectively recognize how the real world works. And that's that was my entire experience as a young adult and as an adult, was going into the world thinking that everyone hated gay people, that, um, that God hated me, that I was going to be lonely for my, the rest of my life. And then that would inform a lot of the decisions that I made as an adult which in turn we ended up reinforcing those, um, those, uh, perceptions, misperceptions because of the trauma that I, that was informing those decisions. So for instance, like when I was like probably like 20, 20, I think 
um, I had, I had a boyfriend at the, my first boyfriend and I got really, I got really remorseful about having lost my family and I tried to rejoin the church and not be gay again. And then I went to like a bishop in the neighborhood and, um, oh my God, he treated me so horribly. Like it was fucking disgusting the way that he treated me. And that just reinforced all of my trauma again, because I went and I offered myself up to somebody who clearly had no interest in my well-being and was going to exploit my vulnerability for his own gain and control. And that, that, that just reinforced my perception of the world. Um, sometimes when I was like younger, um, and like, I was a really good looking kid. Like I was a really good looking young man and I would, um, I was so insecure about being rejected by people that I thought were admirable and sexy that I wouldn't even approach them. And I would instead hit on or accept, um, invitations for romance from people that were honestly like beneath me, um, either, um, in personality, uh, or in looks. Um, I dated this one guy for a long time who was really short and fat because I thought, because I thought like people who were much better looking than him had been mean to me and rejected me. So I thought someone who was short and fat would surely wouldn't be mean to me. Um, and he was someone who ended up like blaming me for being sexually assaulted. Like he blamed me for getting sexually assaulted by somebody um, fucking insane. He was such an abusive narcissist and like looks do not like, you know, <laughs> looks do not correlate with like, uh, abhorrent personalities. Um, and, uh, but I, I would, and I would usually, I was so insecure that I wouldn't even approach really good looking guys. And, but then when I got older, I would have experiences like, so for instance, like, because I'm enormous and I've said this also this stream like three times, I'm six foot seven. Um, when I was younger, I was like 225. Um, I would often get um, hit on when I got older by guys who were like muscle builders and bodybuilders. And I never thought I could like land someone like that. Um, but the reason that they were hitting on me was because part of the reason that like people who work out a lot and build muscle a lot is because they're insecure about being small and want to be big. And I'm just naturally big. <laughs> So they would like, a lot of times they would just throw themselves at me. And like, I had so much great sex with like really hot ripped guys. Like when I was older, um, because I had never understood, I'd never understood that before. Um, but then at the same time, that was just like, you know, that, that's just like a physical attraction. It wasn't like love. And so I wouldn't like, I would not like try to pursue or date anyone that was like that because their attractiveness would really make me feel insecure. Like I couldn't control them. So then I would date people who I thought were less attractive than me. Um, even though I was really attracted to them still, I objectively thought that they were less attractive to me and thereby I would have less likelihood of being rejected. Um, and this plays into a lot of really dysfunctional and even violent, um, interactions in the world of romance between, especially between men and women, but it also happens in gay communities. Um, there are gay rapists and lesbian rapists, um, uh, as well. Um, uh, because we become, because we are traumatized by our experiences growing up, especially around sex that in turn informs our behavior as adults to try to counteract that trauma, but ends up working in against our own best interests. Um, and I, I make this, you know, this is a really simple parable of like, you know, a guy maybe at a bar who goes up to women and hits on them. And if they don't respond favorably, he gets really angry. Um, in that interaction, there might have been a girl adjacent to the one you hit on who thought you were really hot until you behaved like a petulant little child and then became afraid of you because of your behavior. Um, we can very, very much inadvertently self-sabotage our chances and deprive ourselves of the things that we want, like, um, you know, sexual intimacy, um, because of our unresolved trauma. Um, this very often happens with people who are 
nerdy and insecure and shy, shyness is actually a control mechanism. So like, and all of our behaviors are control mechanisms, but like I was really shy when I was younger. And what shyness does is shyness communicates to people that you're insecure. That's exactly what it does. It just tells people that you are not willing to have a direct um, interaction, that it makes you nervous and insecure. So people will respond to that and will maybe will usually like grant that to you. They'll ignore you <laughs> because you are projecting yourself as an insecure person because you're shy. People will treat you like you're shy because that's what you've told them that you wanted. Um, uh, if you want to be intimidating and have people be afraid of you, that will happen as well. Um, you know, we, we are often very good as human beings at projecting um, our will on our environments um, because we also unconsciously read other human beings. And so anyway, so if your trauma around yourself, like say for instance, you're a man who thinks that you're not attractive and that you can't get laid, you go into um, places and environments where you could get laid, but you are actually projecting yourself as an insecure or a narcissist or whatever, you know, whatever it is particularly, and then you don't get laid because you are acting from a place of trauma. A lot of people will, uh, and a lot of advice that you hear on the internet, um, especially will say that you need to project confidence or be confident. It couldn't be any fucking further from the truth. Adopted confidence is not confidence, it's arrogance. There's a big difference between arrogance and confidence. Confidence is sexy, but arrogance is annoying. <laughs> And if you go into an interaction and you are arrogant because you are insecure about yourself and you're trying to be confident, you'll most likely usually fail because arrogance is fucking annoying and it's a turnoff. Confidence is sexy, but guess what? Confidence is not an adopted attitude. Confidence actually comes from lived experiences. People who are confident know that when they do something or are a certain way that it will get them a certain reaction. Um, or, 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 um, result when I, I'm a really good artist. So when I sit down to draw, I know that I, I am confident in that I'm going to draw well because I have done it a lot in the past. You cannot will yourself and pretend that, and this comes back to the, um, the, the part of the lack of self-compassion aspect of trauma is that if you are insecure trying to pretend that you are confident is the opposite of showing yourself compassion. It is totally fine to be insecure. Pretty much everybody is insecure. Actually, <laughs> you are not among strangers. Insecurity is just a natural result of experiment, uh, experiential naivety. When you are not like you, you just haven't had success or you, um, have a flaw or a problem. Um, it's totally fine to be insecure and confidence actually accepts insecurity and weaknesses. That's why confidence is sexy is because people who are actually confident know that they have flaws and are fine with them. They have compassion for themselves as a human being. And then the power of that comes out as confidence. Arrogance denies insecurity and weaknesses. That's why you see arrogant people fail all the time is because they refuse to recognize their insecurities and vulnerabilities. Confidence accepts those. But if you have a lot of trauma in your childhood that teaches you that insecurity is bad and that it's bad to be vulnerable and that it's bad to not be confident, you then act arrogant and in spite and from your trauma and not in spite of your trauma. And so then you end up failing. And so then you never get to learn confidence because confidence comes from succeeding. The way that you succeed in life experiences is by learning effective tools to facilitate success. And a lot of times strategies are more about forcing and controlling environments when we can't do that. You cannot force people. You cannot make them like you. You can't make them respect you. Um, very often people will do that just the opposite, just to spite you. And if you are sufficiently traumatized and arrogant, you will be very vulnerable to that rejection or um, 
antagonism, um, be specifically because your trauma is not resolved. Um, and resolving trauma, um, the, the, the key to, um, the, the, the key that underlies resolving trauma is having compassion for yourself first and foremost. It's okay that we get rejected. It's okay that we experience loss. It's okay that you're traumatized. It's okay that you're ugly. You're probably not. <laughs> you're probably not even ugly, but you think that you're ugly or you're afraid that people will think you're ugly. And you know what? That's fucking fine. I am not attractive anymore. I'm an older guy. I'm 42. I'm not fit. Like, you know, I have way better health than I did when I was 34 because of all the tools that I've learned. But like, you know, I'm fine with that. I'm happy with that. Ironically, actually, do you know how many young men throw themselves at me <laughs> now than they didn't when I was their age? Like a lot of young guys are after daddies. And so when I was 20 and guys weren't into me, I thought it was because there was something wrong with me because that fed into my trauma that I had not yet learned how to resolve. Um, but in reality, they were just into older guys. And so I just had to wait until I was older before those kind of guys started being interested in me. Um, and you know, and then ironically, the only success I had as a 20 year old were pedophiles <laughs> and not really pedophiles. I was 20, but like, you know, I was still naive. And so I, I, be, I felt victim to a lot of, uh, manipulative older people who were into younger ones. And so that further dinged my confidence because it played into a lot of the trauma that I experienced as a child, you know? being raised in a conservative home as a gay person um, was really traumatizing because it taught me that I deserved a lot of the pain that came my way. And then because I did not have skills to effectively navigate life as an abused adult, um, it made that then made me more vulnerable to negative experiences, which just reinforced the trauma that I went through. So anyway, so this is why trauma can be really hard to identify. And then on top of that, really difficult to address, because if you want to address trauma, you have to first be able to identify it as well, or even be willing to identify it. Because a lot of us feel very comforted by our control mechanisms. And then like, you know, I, I, if anybody had even told me that I was an alcoholic when I was 26, I would have probably told them to go fuck themselves, you know, but I was an alcoholic. Um, you know, and I had a lot of trauma and, um, part of that trauma was being told that I, you know, was not worth anything and I, that I was worthless and not attractive and, um, not valuable. And so I thought in admitting my trauma and facing those things, it would literally just reinforce that trauma. But the opposite is true by addressing and confronting your trauma, you actually become empowered to resolve it and to learn how to have compassion for yourself. And so like I asked earlier in the stream, what you guys thought, um, it looked like to have compassion for yourself. Is it like going out and getting some ice cream or is it like going to the gym and taking care of yourself? Quote unquote. Um, no, that's not what self-compassion is. Um, uh, well, I mean, it can be, I mean, actually, sorry, the, the ice cream thing was a bad metaphor because going out and getting ice cream for yourself is, is uh, can be an act of self-compassion. Um, but self-compassion is is just having like, so it, but it's an action. Self-compassion is not just an attitude. So like, you know, people might say that like having compassion for yourself might be like, oh, like it's okay if I'm fat. And yeah, but compassion is actually, self-compassion is actually action. So like, so for instance, like compassion would be like going to go get ice cream, even though you think you're fat. <laughs> that is an act of self-compassion. Um, sitting down and doing trauma inventory is the best form of self-compassion that you can practice because you are actually sitting down to take care of your needs where your needs were not taken care of when you were a child. Your parents did not have the capacity to care for you because of their own trauma. Your parents were traumatized every in every way, maybe even more, sometimes less than you have been traumatized. And they did not have the capacity to give you the skills that you need in order to overcome your own trauma. So having compassion means sitting down and teaching yourself those skills. And that's what the inventory therapy does as well. The inventory therapy sits you down and walks you through the process of resolving trauma through having compassion for yourself. And that in turn, ironically, gives you more control over your life because you stop wasting control mechanisms on things you can't control. And it shifts your focus onto things that you actually can control. So for instance, like you, we, you cannot control what you look like, really. Like it doesn't matter how well you eat or you know how well you quote unquote take care of your body. 
the idea that you can actually shape and can, can control what you look like is a total illusion. We are mortal animals that are governed by specific laws of the physical world that include disease and infectious illness and stuff like that. And very often, a lot of us actually, because we're working from a place of trauma, end up causing us more physical harm by doing self-destructive things like starving ourselves and dieting or taking dangerous supplements. Um, a lot of people don't know, there, in, in a lot of the weightlifting building community, there's a use of, um, Sam E is a very popular supplement. Um, Sam E promotes high stress hormones and it's part of the reason that you can't sit still and you can't sleep and you feel restless all the time because your stress hormones are so high because you're abusing your body and you don't even recognize that you are because you're operating from a place of trauma and lack of self-compassion. So like the, um, the, 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 the inventory therapy teaches you how to have compassion for yourself. And that is the key to resolving trauma is to learn how to have compassion for yourself. And you can teach yourself these skills as well. I, I used to wonder when I was younger, like, and not younger, I mean, like, like four years ago, like, how do I learn? And not four, like six years ago, how do I learn the skills that I want to learn? I didn't know anybody that could teach me the stuff I wanted to learn. I looked everywhere and I could not find it. No one I knew had the skills like I wanted to learn, like having self-compassion, having confidence. Everyone was insecure and arrogant and like, you know, even books and outlets and people that ostensibly say that that's the stuff they can teach you, they don't. It comes from a place of insecurity. But as I was like practicing inventory therapy, I realized that I could teach myself the skills that I've always wanted. And you learn that by doing just the act of doing inventory therapy teaches you those skills. Um, and then that, and then, and then, so we were talking about confidence not too long ago. Um, oh, uh, Mike, how does psilocybin work to heal trauma for people? Okay. So first of all, it doesn't, um, LSD and those psychological medicines, they do not heal trauma, but they can support trauma healing on their own. They do not do it. On their own, one of the therapeutic reasons that those work is because um, they count. Okay, so when you okay, so in in my last few streams on depression and the one on the endocrine system and the one on alcoholism and addiction, I talk about how trauma physically affects us. So trauma physically. So elicit, 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 oh my God, this is so long. I can't even make words now. Um, physical trauma, I mean, mental and emotional trauma translates into physical stress. It makes your body produce high stress hormones and high torporific hormones. Drugs counteract that endocrinological response, which is why there is self therapy um, method of handling trauma. Um, because most people don't have the skills to actually resolve the trauma. They resort to drug use in order to, um, uh, medically intervene in the biological pathways that trauma affects. So specifically though, drugs like LSD, um, psilocybin, and what's the one that they prescribe for <coughs> naltrexone and like naltrexone. They specifically counteract um, serotonin and melatonin, which are hormones of guilt and shame. So like if you do something wrong, your one of the ways in which your body facilitates the instinct of remorse is by increasing the expression of serotonin and uh, melatonin. More specifically, I think probably serotonin. Serotonin is a hormone of, is a hormone of guilt and shame. So if you take drugs that suppress serotonin, you can remove the feeling of guilt and shame from your experience. But the problem is, is it does not actually remove your conscience, <laughs> which is a which is just a consciousness function, a function of being alive. So you know that you do so, do something wrong, and then you continue to treat it with like cocaine or or LSD or something psilocybin instead of addressing your mistakes all you end up doing is is accumulating more and more and more mistakes and feeling more and more guilty requiring more and more drugs to deal with that problem um trauma 
uh, artificially raises serotonin and melatonin and makes you feel guilt and shame for things that you may not necessarily need to feel guilt for. For instance, I tell this story in my book about how I my dad gave me a dog for my 10th birthday. He was a Cocker Spaniel named Dudley, and I loved him so much, and he was adorable. And um, uh, But Dudley... Uh, he, my dad made Dudley live out in the backyard and we lived in Utah and the winters in Utah get horribly cold and Dudley would get, um, ice balls built up on his fur and he had to live out in the, in the, in the doghouse by himself. And he's a little cocker spaniel. He's not like some huge, like, you know, hound that has a lot of body mass. He's like a little cocker spaniel. And, um, on top of that, you know, dogs are pack animals just like humans are. Humans are pack animals and dogs are pack animals too. And dogs need social interaction. And he didn't get that. He uh, was forced to live by himself outside in the backyard all the time. And that made him go crazy. And he ended up biting my little sister. And then my dad gave him away. And then one time when we were visiting our cousins, my dad gave Dudley away um, uh, to get rid of him. And then didn't tell us until we got home. And I was heartbroken. But for most of my life, I felt guilty about that situation. Like I felt that like I failed Dudley and it still makes me um, sad. And, um, but what actually happened was I didn't realize that I tried to help him that as a child, I was powerless to dictate how our house was run and what, and what, and how Dudley was allowed to, um, to be in our house or not. I actually did what was right. I tried to take care of him. I did my best and I tried to advocate for him. And because, but I still had, but because I was raised in a culture that was very shame based, I felt very guilty my entire life um, because of that. And it wasn't until I did inventory therapy as a 36, 37, actually, no, I, I didn't do this one specifically until probably like three years ago. So 39. Um, until I was 39, I did not even realize until I did the inventory therapy on this specific thing that I didn't actually hurt Dudley, that like I tried to do what was best for him and take care of him. And I'm getting teared up because the relief from realizing that, like, that, like I did not actually do anything wrong, um, was such a relief because I loved him and I felt so bad. And I hadn't even considered that my dad probably gave him to somebody who loved him and he probably had a really good life. Like, I think my dad gave him to like some old, older couple and Dudley probably lived a long and happy life with people that adored him and he was probably safe and got to live inside. And, you know, and that, that never even occurred to me either. And, um, and it didn't happen until I did the inventory therapy because, again, like I mentioned before, you cannot be conscious of the trauma that you carry. That's why it affects your life. And that's why you have to actually like address it through these self-compassionate, self-introspective therapies um, because they communicate with the unconscious. And the more that you do, the more it also uncovers. So when you first do um, inventory therapy, you'll do a lot of really big things, like things about your parents and like your you know ex-boyfriends and girlfriends and embarrassing episodes at school and failures at work and stuff like that. And then as you clear away those bigger things, it will actually, your brain will actually be able to remember smaller things that are no less important though, that that you just haven't remembered because you've accumulated so much trauma. And it's like, this was one of those things that I didn't even think about until I was 39 after I had been practicing inventory therapy for now, like, um, four years, five, no. Cause I first learned, I went into AA when I was 34. So it was, it was, it was four and a half years before I even did this one, did this one. Um, so it's a really, really effective tool in resolving trauma, and it's, and and as and as trauma happens, and it it helps you deal with life because you stop trying to prevent things or control things in life that you actually can't control or prevent. And it's one of the ironies of my work because you know I'm a big nutrition advocate and I'm all about health and I talk about hair and weight and and all these things, and yet like I don't even really care about them <laughs> because like trauma like the trauma therapy that I developed helped to so effectively resolve my trauma that those things aren't even important to me anymore. 
Um, you know, um, I have such wonderful life, uh, such a wonderful life. Um, every day I, for the first time in my life, I started being excited about waking up in the morning. Um, and I don't need relationships either to make me, to make me feel fulfilled. Um, my own, com my own company is, means a lot to me. Like it, it, I mean, it never did before. These are all really strange and new experiences. And that's one of the reasons why people also can be really resistant to practicing inventory therapy is the idea of digging that deep can be really frightening. Um, you, you're used to what you're used to, even if the, what you're used to is very traumatic. Um, and it can be really scary to try to dig down and, and learn more about yourself. Um, but you know, but doing so for me with this method only served to give me confidence for the first time in my life to help me feel, feel fulfilled and satisfied no matter what happens. Um, you know, a lot of us, what a lot of us do that have trauma and tell me if you guys relate to this, cause I'm sure that a lot of you do. Um, how many of you are constantly looking forward to like the next holiday or the next vacation. Oh, uh, I gotta go back to work, but you know, Thanksgiving, Halloween's coming up and Thanksgiving's coming up. Like, you know, I, like those will be fun. I, I can just, I can keep persisting until those things the, that's, those are a reason to live. <laughs> Basically is what a lot of us do, especially if you have like a day job, you know, you're just constantly working, looking forward to the next vacation. And that's how you spend your entire life is just looking forward to the future because you're not able to actually enjoy the present, but it's not because of your attitude, which is what most people tell you. It's because you have these traumatic experiences um, in your past that colored your perception of life in this way. Um, and so, and that's why it never changes. Um, how many of you also lay awake at night with your brain, um, you know, ruminating over imagined screenplays of the interactions with people that you may not even may not may or may not know like you know oh you had an unpleasant experience with your boss you know that day so then you come up with an imaginary conversation about how you would have defended yourself and what is going to say next and then what's going to happen that is a defensive control mechanism to anticipate threats to your well-being in the future that's an instinct that is a human instinct a, a brain that is constantly ruminating on dialogue and remorse and regret and fear of confrontation that is trauma because you have been through trauma that has conditioned you to anticipate pain and rejection and um discomfort in the future then your brain is constantly in a state of, state of hyper awareness trying to anticipate those things so you entertain these fantasies and made up scenarios that don't even happen just so you can be prepared for the eventuality that it might but that is all a misconception about how life really works about your value as an individual and also what you're capable of as a person and when i um, finished doing the inventory therapy, all of those things went away. I, my brain finally stopped talking. I could actually just like exist and just enjoy my day. Um, you'd be surprised how much emotional energy that saves too. It's absolutely incredible. Um, I stopped going through ruminating, like imagined scenarios. Like it was insane. I couldn't, it's such a weird thing that it, that even happens, but a lot of us have that. And it's because of our unresolved trauma growing up. Um, uh, um, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, oh, mercy, no relationships and no therapist. That is really good to know you can get there doing the inventory. Yeah. Some therapy was not great in my experience. Yeah. I mean, like I, like I mentioned earlier, like the reason that most therapists are not effective is because they are the type two uh, category of the Cartman drama triangles, which is the helper, which is a person who views their only value as originating from being of use to other people. So they purposefully are ineffective in their assistance because being effective would then um, mean an existential crisis for the, that person. They would have no value to others and thus none to themselves. Um, the, 
The type three, which is what I was, is the victim type, which feels that they need more powerful people to get what they want. And then the type, the first type is the persecutor type, which is people who think everyone else is standing in their way. Um, but yeah, so like, so, so, and that's also why therapists also don't usually teach the Cartman drama triangle is because they are the type two helper personality. Um, and, um, being aware of that and resolving that it becomes an existential crisis. So it's, and so they don't do that. Um, and it, it's also like uh, knowing about the carbon trauma drama triangle is also very empowering, which is why it's in my book. Um, and, um, and learning about that in, in combination with having the inventory therapy, you know, yeah, resolved. I would say all of my trauma. I mean, there's probably, you know, a little bit that I don't know about even um because trauma you know undoing a, an, an entire lifetime of trauma is really difficult but like i would i would effectively say that i resolved all of my trauma trauma doesn't stop happening though which is also one of the other problems and like when we become adults especially if you become a parent um you continue to encounter unpleasant experiences in your life you have people steal from you uh the government will come after you the irs um employers friends you know your your romantic partner might, might might reject you you might lose a kid like or a dog um people might make fun of you like there's there are so many traumatic things that can continue happening as an adult and that's one of the reasons why people who are alcoholics and addicts have such a hard time getting sober is that they are dealing with an immense amount of trauma without skills to resolve it while continuing to live in a world in which we are continually subjected to harmful and disappointing experiences. But th that's what the inventory therapy does though. It, it actually empowers you also to handle those things. Like I have the ability now to not be upset by financial stresses. Like it doesn't matter to me anymore. Like I, like I used to have such anxiety around money and finances. Um, and like, and now it's just like, it's just money. And, but that's not an attitude change. I did not will myself to get better. I took the time and practiced self-compassion doing the inventory therapy and addressing my past experiences of trauma, which taught me to have compassion for myself. Of course, financial experiences are stressful. Like anyone who pretends they're not is stupid. Like, you know, it's inconvenient. Um, my car got towed a while ago, <laughs> just on the street one day, parked in the wrong spot. It got towed. I laughed at myself and I was like, yeah, this is really inconvenient. And that was dumb, but you know, I'll just go get it. And like, and that was fine. It didn't like, it didn't even ruin my day. And that never would have happened when I was younger because my trauma would have told me that I was a loser and irresponsible and forgetful. And now I have compassion for myself because I took the time to do that work. Because remember, compassion is action. It's not just an attitude toward yourself. You have to do, you have to take care of yourself. And doing the inventory therapy um, is a, an act of taking care of yourself because you directly address the trauma that you have been through and learn more about who you are as a person. Um, and that's empowering. Um, and I also talked about like, you know, a lot of like, actually, I might have mentioned this, like, I, I talked about a lot, a lot of this is like learning, like, tangible skills, you know, like, um, like, like doing the therapy or like, you know, taking care of yourself. But a lot of the skills that you learn from the inventory therapy are mental and emotional skills, um, how to handle rejection, how to um, cope with um, uh, despair. Um, you know, um, men mental skills, like mental health skills. So, um, okay, we we can officially translate transition into the Q and A section. Jesus fucking Christ, I can't believe this took so long. Um, trauma is really complicated, though, so I guess that makes more sense. <laughs> um, I would really get a lot out of reading Laura Barrett Feldman. She's about the predicting mind and metabolism. I think you've mentioned her before. What do I think of somatic healing by Peter Levine? I <laughs> I don't. I'm sorry, Mike. I, I don't know any of these people. And I, you know, and if we're being honest too, I wouldn't like them. I'm very arrogant. 
I don't think that people, I don't think that people understand psychology and, and human health the way that I do. The, a lot of the general health and, um, wellness stuff that's out there, especially academic and, and, um, and, uh, and, and institutional stuff, uh, retains a lot of biases and prejudices that get in the way and cause, um, and cause problems and are exactly why I was not able to get better until I figured out this stuff for myself. And I, I mean, the AA stuff wasn't myself. I had a sponsor who taught me the 12 steps and I'm ever grateful for him, but they didn't recognize the psychological or nutritional aspects in addiction. That's what I did. And I, so I adopted a lot of the useful things that were in there. Um, but the stuff that I talk about is kind of, I, I heard of somebody that tried to write like the 12 steps for non-alcohol, but that's not what my, my book is. My book is very specifically the inventory, uh, practice. Um, the 12, that's only one step in the 12 step. And, um, it's in my opinion, the inventory therapy is the most important and the only one that affects your psyche as dramatically. Um, and that has universal application. <clears throat> across the board that people don't recognize. Um, I don't even know what somatic healing is. <laughs> um, but yeah, that was a really long podcast. If you guys stayed with that, thanks. We, um, If you have questions um, that you want answered, I think some of you ans asked me questions earlier um, and that was a long time ago. Um, please ask them again um, and we'll get to those questions um, as you ask them. And when we run out of questions, um, then we will end the stream. So, <laughs> um, but somatic healing. I don't even know what that means. Um, Wikipedia says, somatic experiencing is a method of alternative therapy for treating trauma and stress-related disorders like PTSD. The primary goal of somatic experiencing is to modify the trauma stress related response through bottom-up processing clients attention is directed toward internal sensations rather than to cognitive or emotional experiences um oh the method is developed yeah developed by peter levine um somatic sessions are normally held in person and then involve client attacking their physical experiences um to me this sounds a lot like oh yeah actually they're kind of saying that um uh, practitioners are often me mental health practitioners as well as, um, massage therapists, rolfers. I, I did rolfing. Do you guys know about that? <laughs> it was really, really invasive. Um, someone, one of my friends did it to me when I was younger. Um, and I did not like it. Um, it did actually have like a positive effect on my body, but it was also very, um, uncomfortable to go through. Um, to me, this sounds okay. This is this is why I view my therapy as superior to any that exist uh, right now. <clears throat> is like the difference between between um, between mine and uh, this thing. So uh, this basic this practice basically um is just the same sort of general um therapy in um accepted uh psychology practices um wherein they actually ignore uh your um where they where they actually ignore your experience um and that sounds really ironic because like in um for in, for instance like uh in in like a ther in a, in like a typical therapy session um a therapist you know you'll talk ad nauseum about an event of some occurrence right right um but but you end up actually ignoring the person's the reason that the person um had the traumatic experience in the first place and here's a really a great tangible example um of my from my own when I was, I think I was like 28 and I had just got kind of gotten out of a unfulfilling, um, relationship in which my partner at the time, um, we'd only been together. We'd been together for about a year. Uh, and he was really cute and I loved him. Um, but he was really not committed to our relationship. Um, he wasn't out to his family. Um, and he 
kind of, and we argued a little bit, but we had a lot of fun together mostly, mostly. Um, but he ended up cheating on me and, um, uh, just kind of checking out at the end. Um, and I could tell he wasn't really that interested again. And, um, then immediately after that, I met this, um, when I was visiting home from a home, um, during Christmas one time, I met this gorgeous Mormon. He was almost as tall as me. He was six foot six. He was so handsome. And we had this really hot affair. And, um, but then he ended up being really traumatized too. And, um, sort of after, after like a, after like a really intense, like two and a half month, um, fling, he just ghosted on me and I was, and I was just really traumatized. And this was, this was right when probably at the beginning of a lot of my severe physical health problems. And then, so I didn't know at the time that I had like extreme expression of like adrenaline and cortisol going on in my body, which was amplifying my mental illness. And, um, but I, so I went to a therapist who was the vice president of psychology at UCLA. And if anyone was going to be a good therapist, you know, you'd think it'd be somebody who was like a, a, prodi a pro prodigious. <laughs> oh my God. I can't talk. I've been talking for too long. Prestigious, it, uh, um, you know, occupied a prestigious academic, um, position like that. And for, I think I went to him for a total of 10 sessions. And even at the 10th fucking session, we were still talking about my breakup. And I had specifically expressed a desire to learn tools to cope with those problems and recover from them. And all he was doing was continually bringing me back to experiencing that uh, event. And every session I left crying. And I didn't get better at all. I didn't make any success. And actually, right after that one was when I found the psychiatrist who helped, um, who was the one that helped me, who taught me breathing exercises. So she actually gave me some tools to um, to address that. These kinds of therapies don't work because they don't empower the person. All they do is just revisit continually. And that's how that's actually that this is actually exactly how the Cartman drama triangle helper personality functions is to act like they're helping, but in fact, continually reinforce the trauma that the person experienced by failing to empower them with tools that would empower them to overcome it. And that's why the inventory therapy actually does work is because it is a tool. Like you literally teach yourself a writing practice that helps you to analyze and metabolize and resolve your, um, experiences with abuse, rejection, trauma, discomfort, et cetera. Um, and it actually empowers you. And so that's why it, that's why it worked for me. And that's why, um, that's why it works. And, and that's why I don't like these kinds of things is because these kinds of therapies are made up by people who don't actually have an interest in you getting better. They want you to be continually reliant on the therapy process. And that's why these therapy processes also take like years, like, you know, and they don't necessarily resolve or work the, 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 the boy that I had the affair with, the tall Mormon, um, he was sexually abused as a ch as a child, and um, he went to years of therapy. I think he had two or three years of therapy with a sexual abuse expert, and right into getting into a relationship with me, started reliving those abuse experiences, and that was one of the reasons why he checked out of our relationship was because being emotionally vulnerable with me made him. Um, feel insecure and vulnerable like he was when he was being abused and because he was not taught um effective mental health skills to handle that trauma um it failed him and that's what this seems to do too um and that's also oh and also because we you know we talked about um we talked about drug drug supported therapy like lsd and psilocybin and those kinds of things um like one of the reasons they can work is because the traumatic experience damages the dorsal reef nucleus in the brain, which causes it to out express higher levels of serotonin and melatonin, which remember are hormones of torpor, but they are also the hormones of guilt and shame. 
And so if you medicinally suppress those through pharmacological intervention, the brain is more receptive to having new experiences um, because you're not being burdened with these chemical um, shame, these the feelings of shame and guilt that can impair those those problems. Um, in fact, many much of the barrier that I experience when working with people with the inventory therapy before they even try it, they're reluctant to try it because they think it's just going to make them feel worse about their mistakes and their insecurities just through the virtue of having to confront them. Um, and they don't understand the point of it um, because, you know, it's fair. It's it's very complex and it's really hard to understand that. Um, and these therapies do not um, actively challenge the um, person to confront those things. They instead entertain the trauma. Um, and so that's why they don't work, but that, but that's why the drugs can also, um, can factor in there because you can, you can pharmacologically like reduce the, um, serotonin and melatonin. And if you combine that with effective mental health therapy, then it can have a greater outcome. But if you don't, it doesn't work long-term. And actually a lot of people like, um, a lot of people actually, um, end up experiencing, worse um relapsing of mental health issues from using those drugs because all they do is give you a temporary reprieve from the chemical biological aspect of trauma but not the actual psychological aspect of the trauma like you still have the trauma like you haven't addressed it you've just used a drug so that and that that's why they don't end up work, working long term um if you were to use those drugs and do um inventory therapy you might have a great effect, but I didn't use any drugs while I was doing it and worked really great. So, so they're not necessary. Um, where were the other questions? Um, do I share inventory with 12 step with sponsor? Wait. Oh, um, <coughs> sorry. I didn't understand what you meant, but I do now. Um, it can be helpful to share the inventory therapy with a compassionate listener. Yes. One of the big benefits that I got from doing 12 steps was it was the first time in my entire life that anybody showed interest in my well-being. My partners, my romantic partners were never interested in my well-being. They were only interested in satisfying their needs. They would do things once in a while for me, you know, like buy presents or but my function in their life was to make them feel less lonely. That's exactly the opposite of being concerned with my well-being. And being raised in a conservative um, family <clears throat> who had no interest in the well-being of anyone in it, you know, um, uh, and also because of my control and coping mechanisms, I had only ever also cultivated friends that were superficial. My sponsor in AA was the first time that anyone ever made themselves available to me to help me with my problems. And that was one of the major therapeutic um, benefits of being in that program. Um, and, um, and for that reason, it can be very helpful to share inventory with a compassionate listener, but it's not required. And I also constructed it to specifically not to require that because sometimes it's very difficult to get that. Like, um, one of the things you don't want to do is share your, um, inventory th with your spouse generally. <laughs> um, um, I know these two people who volunteered at a Mormon AA, um, meeting, which it's not supposed to be religious. It's a complete violation of the standards of AA. Um, it is not supposed to be affiliated with, with religions. And yet they have done that and they ask members to go volunteer there uh, to help proselytize and, 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 um, and, and it's just awful and it doesn't work. Um, but, but. Um, those two people learned the inventory therapy there, or at least they think they did. They did not have a sponsor. They were not alcohol, ac active alcohol, alcohol users or drug users ever. Um, although they had, they did have dry alcoholism, which is a whole different topic, but, um, and then all they did was proceed to make inventories about how much they hated each other and then shared those with each other during a road trip. <laughs> And like, that isn't how it works at all. And also, actually, that brings me to a point too. Sometimes people can use the inventory therapy to practice self-pity. 
Now, self pity. A lot of people will get really shaming on self pityers and 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 hate you and make you feel bad about it. But self pity actually self pity functions as a way to find value in oneself when it's not forthcoming from your environment. Like self pity serves a valuable purpose for people to cope with a lot of um, stresses in life. But if you entertain self pity, it will just get stronger. And if you use the inventory therapy to entertain self pity, it won't work for you because you. Um, you you you're you're ignoring your own culpability. A lot of self pity actually ignores culpability. For instance, like choosing to be in a relationship with an abusive person. Like, yeah, you might love them, and yeah, it might be hard to break up with them. I certainly didn't break up with mine, but like you know, but having having an excessive self pity for myself meant that I did not take responsibility for my decision to remain in that relationship. I could have left his ass the first time that he cheated on me, and I didn't. And I did not accept responsibility for that behavior until I taught myself skills to do so through the inventory therapy. So, so yeah. Um, York, is COVID vaccine harmful? You're unvaxxed. No. Um, I, the, you know, this has been a really big um, source of conflict around the entire world. Um, especially in a lot of these health circles. I know a lot of leading figures, even ones that I respect, came out against vaccines, which was very surprising. Um, <clears throat> this has been a really long stream, um, and I don't intentionally want to make it longer, and I'll try not to, but, okay, so like, so like for instance, like one of the, one of the, um, one of the, uh, okay. Uh, several actually. So uh, some of the, some of the, um, arguments that I've heard against the vaccine, um, the vaccine causes inflammation. Um, the vaccine causes inflammation <clears throat> is one of, one of them. What the fuck do you think anything is that happens in our body that isn't inflammation? Like inflammation is how the body chemically communicates with itself. When you have an infection, let's say you get the flu or you get um, a cold, or you get herpes viruses. The immune response is facilitated, hey Lou, the immune response is facilitated by inflammation. Inflammation is supposed to happen from a vaccine. That is how the immune system is imprinted upon. It's like saying that you drink water to quench your thirst. Like, yes, like having a vaccine is meant to invoke inflammation. That's how it actually inoculates you uh, with um, immune protection. I'm going to say this and I'm not vaccinated <laughs> actually though. So, but I, I, I had, I had, I got COVID three times and I know how to treat it. And I just haven't gotten vaccinated because I know that. So if I if I didn't know how to treat COVID and I was much and I was much more at risk of of uh, health problems from it, I would definitely get vaccinated. Um, but I, I don't need to. Um, but the stuff the the way that people are talking about the vaccine is so insane and and dumb. Another thing is like you know people were like, oh, they developed the vaccine too, way too quickly. It can't possibly be good. No, they developed the COVID the COVID vaccine very quickly, but not the technology that underlied its um, manufacture. Um, scientists have for a very long time been working on, um, vaccines where they could artificially model the, um, like proteins in, in viruses and then employ that as a vaccine. So the development of the technology that underlie the COVID vaccine has been in development for, for a very long time. The COVID vaccine was, as far as I know of only just the first, um, time that that technology was used. Um, and then that transitions into the, or segues into the next one of the other arguments I've heard about the, um, M M R is it MRA? I can't remember what the acronym is. The actual like, um, viral spike protein that is administered in there. This one really gets me because like, what the fuck do you think happens when an actual virus infects your cells? Like, People were getting all up in arms about the MR, is it MRA or MRA, MRA, like MRA vaccine, is that? MRNA, that's why I was getting confused. The MRNA, um, uh, it's just clearly a product of naivety about how disease works in the first place. 
Um, this goes into a lot of trauma, actually, you know, since we are actually talking about trauma, a lot of people have trauma around disease and illness. Um, you know, God knows the gay community, you know, when we went through, um, really traumatic, um, uh, assault from the HIV virus, in addition to social, um, harassment and lack of help from, our societies and governments and even our own families very often, uh, a lot of times even moms um, would um, abandon their sons when they were dying. Um, and, um, but you know, HIV doesn't just infect gay people and it infects everybody. Like that's not how disease works, but disease can be very scary for a lot of people in turn, because people, a lot of people have trauma over death. So for instance, if you're raised in an environment that teaches you to be afraid of death, and then also afraid of disease. When you're confronted by death and disease, you go fucking crazy and you do not act like a sane person because you are terrified of it. Um, we all die, um, but a lot of us are so afraid of death that we'll do really insane things to try to avoid that. I mean, God, like, you know, God knows like rich people like carve up their bodies and end up looking like a mangled Barbie doll that got put under a hair dryer for too long. Um, you know, be just because they're so afraid of getting old, they end up looking like freakish crazy people. Um, that's what trauma does to you. Trauma, trauma prevents us from acting effectively in our lives. And when there's a pandemic, um, you know, it's effective to be informed and smart and rational. And when you start like, you know, running around and coughing on people as a political protest. Like, <laughs> it's so stupid. Like, you're not accomplishing anything good for anyone nor yourself. You're putting yourself in danger. Um, <coughs> excuse me, you're putting other people in danger. And disease, disease does exist. A lot of people's motivation for uh, being anti-vax is because they're also so just afraid of disease in the first place that they want to pretend that it doesn't exist. But disease does exist, unfortunately. We live in a mortal, you know, we, live, we are mortal beings. That's ostensibly the entire point of believing in God and religions is accepting that we are mortal. But in fact, actually, a lot of the point of religion and religious belief is to try to ignore that fact and to try to anesthetize our fears by adopting um, religious and mystical um, uh, um, you know, antidotes to that fear. Uh, but it's also conversely why too, like uh, why a lot of li religious people get crazier as they get older, because those things you're, you're pretending that it's not real. Like you're pretending that death isn't real and it is real and you know, it's real. And so as the closer you get to death, the more insane you get because, <laughs> because you don't have effective coping mechanisms and that originates from um, trauma, but it's also a problem of lacking compassion for yourself. Like I was talking about earlier, like religion very often expressly teaches you to withhold compassion from yourself, you know, for wanting um, to be happy, to have sex, um, for dealing with mistakes. Uh, religion actively teaches you to withhold compassion from yourself and from other people. So when you need compassion and when you encounter difficult life experiences, you don't know how to do that because you've never been taught nor practiced it. So when you're confronted by a pandemic that could very well take your life, one of the uh, coping mechanisms uh, that originates from our trauma and our lack of, uh, effective self-care skills is just to pretend that it doesn't exist. You know, um, more policemen died from COVID. Uh, I don't remember which years and the exact statistics, uh, but they, more policemen died from COVID infection than they did from, um, crime, crime and violence um, during one or more of the years that COVID has been going because number one, their job puts them in direct contact with other people, which is a great way to get exposed. But number two, a lot of people who are police fundamentally have fears around control and want to control, um, their environment through force, through authoritarian and, um, uh, sanctioned, uh, behavior. And that empowers delusional coping mechanisms like pretending that 
this virus isn't real and it wasn't a problem. And so a lot of people died from it. Um, you know, so, but anyway, so the MR, the, the fear around the MRNA, uh, vaccine was because it's novel because it's new and people don't understand it. Uh, a virus does the exact same fucking thing when it enters your cells. So your choice is either to get COVID and have those, uh, spike proteins enter from the actual virus or to get it in the vaccine. I will say I do have problems with some vaccines though. Um, for instance, mercury has always been a really, um, uh, uh, harmful additive that is in vaccines. Uh, the anti-vaccine movement for all of its insane insanity, um, was effective in getting mercury removed from childhood vaccines. Um, but the, um, no such effort was made in production of the COVID vaccine to make one without, um, or at least, I don't know if it's all of them, but like, uh, at least some of them or a lot of them have mercury in them, even for kids. And that needed to be avoided. Um, injecting mercury into human beings is a fucking stupid idea. Um, you can detox from it though. It's not, it's not as horrible as a lot of people make it seem to be. The body does have, um, mechanisms for detoxing mercury. Um, but I didn't like that. Um, that should have been avoided. There should have been, every effort should have been made to make vaccines without toxic problems like that. There are some other toxic chemicals in vaccines that are a problem. Um, um, you can also have people who are, um, susceptible to side effects from the vaccines that can be debilitating. Um, that doesn't mean that you should avoid the vaccine. There's just like, you know, um, at this point it becomes choose your poison, either die by the vaccine or die by the virus. I mean, not everybody, obviously. Um, but one of the reasons that we have such low, and also, and also this is a really complex issue because in my, I, I wrote several articles throughout the course of the pandemic in my, on my page. The first one was how to treat it, which was very effective. I helped a lot of people who actually know about my work, um, address COVID infections and successfully get over them. Um, my own parents, like who don't even listen to me did some of my, like I, like I talked about some of the uh, suggestions in my, uh, about that in terms of aesthetics and looking good. And so they actually were taking riboflavin and aspirin at the time, um, and hardly had any symptoms when they got, um, when they got COVID. Um, and I forgot what I was saying. Um, but, oh, yeah. Um, part of the reason that we have such low numbers of COVID right now is because people were inoculated uh, so many times and so many people also got it that we actually re reached a degree of herd immunity. But I wrote a very important article that, you know, I don't have much of an audience at all. What, there's six people in here right now. <laughs> Thank you for being here though. I love you guys. You, I, I wouldn't even be able to do this if anybody wasn't here. Um, but I wrote a very important article about how, uh, COVID was not going to end anytime soon. Um, like just like three or six months into the pandemic, a lot of people were like, Oh, the vaccine's going to be here soon. And it's just going to go away soon. And I was like, no, that's not how it fucking works. Like coronaviruses, uh, are highly adaptive. They're related to flu viruses and they can mutate very easily. And, um, and there was no way that we were going to be able to inoculate everyone in the country that needed to be inoculated against every strain that was going to come out. And that happened. And I, I said it like a year and a half before it actually happened. Um, but you know, I have no platform, so I can't really affect policy that much like that. Um, but, um, you know, eventually now we've have gotten to the space where enough people have finally gotten it or been inoculated many times over that the rates have reduced quite a bit. Um, so no, the COVID vaccine is not harmful. The people who are saying it is are people who have trauma around illness and don't understand what the fuck is going on and um, are probably not people that you should be listening to anyway about that kind of shit. Um, but you also don't have to throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? Like, like there are like issues with vaccination um, those are more systemic about our general medical institutions anyway. Like for instance, like the CDC, they used to do this fucking stupid thing where they would overestimate the number of flu deaths every year because they would lump every single possible death from, from lung disease. Like, like if it was, 
Um, I can't remember all the things, but it wasn't just lung. It wasn't just the flu. They would artificially inflate flu numbers in order to encourage more people to get vaccinated against the flu. That is looks very nefarious. I believe that they did it from a point of excessive um, precaution to try to get as many vulnerable people as vaccinated as possible. But we do also live in this um, in economy where there's profiteering off of medicine and illness. So you can't expect people to act crazy about that kind of stuff when you actually are part of the problem. And the CDC very much participated in the dysfunction that um, circulated a lot of a lot of the problems around the vaccine vaccination and and also and also like I don't necessarily even believe the vaccination was necessary if anybody of consequence knew how the virus worked why people died from it so for instance so this is why and this is going you can you, you guys can leave if you're bored it's been like three hours <laughs> um um, this is how people were dying of the vaccine. Uh, I mean, not the vaccine of the virus. So, um, you know, most people at this point know that w when you die from COVID, it's because your um, oxygen levels decline so much. That's why you're on a ventilator. And oh, and then there were all these people talking about ventilators. They don't fucking know what they're talking about either. So um, the mechanism of mortality mostly from COVID, especially before it started mutating a lot into less um, dangerous forms, was that if you, a lot of people, so if you have, okay, so our body uses um, riboflavin in uh, flavin, um, uh, so okay, so there's 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 this um, uh, uh, compound in our body called NAD, which is nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. A lot of people know about that. It's part of your health and active like met metabolic system. There's a flavin, a riboflavin version of it called flavin adenine dinucleotide, which also is extremely important and participates in a lot of pathways. Um, our body uses flavin dependent enzymes to attack viruses. Those are a lot like um, oxidases, which they actually use the oxygen in water to attack and oxidize foreign pathogen bo uh, bodies in the in the body, and um, and and that and those require riboflavin. But you can also become deficient from riboflavin from excessive metabolic disease, um, and um, and and a poor diet, which is why people who had pre-existing conditions were more likely to die um, from the disease um, callously, you know, sacrificed to the disease. By like even by even by like leading nutritionist people that are in this fucking community, we're like we're basically like they're old, they're gonna die anyway. They should just die, and we shouldn't shut down. We, which these are health professionals that are supposed to be concerned with others' wellness. And if you were listening to someone who says that, you need to not listen to them ever again. They don't care about your well being. You heard them. They would just offer you up to the virus if you're ill and think that you deserve it. So fucking stupid. So anyway, so um, when you're metabolically ill, you often are riboflavin deficient. And because riboflavin is required in the immune um, system to fight viruses, um, but, oh, sorry, but it, riboflavin is also required as a cofactor for oxygen transport in hemoglobin around the body. So... You're riboflavin deficient, but you get infected with a virus that requires a very large immune response that very rapidly depletes your already low riboflavin levels. And then that in turn impairs oxygen transport around your body. That's why the oxygen, your oxygen levels decline, which is why then medical professionals were hooking people up to um, breathing um, apparatuses, but they should have just been giving them riboflavin actually. Um, um, and then they would die because um, your ability to transport oxygen was impaired by the depletion of riboflavin. So, um, so like if anyone, if I had access to anybody that, you know, had control and power and, and had a platform, we wouldn't even have needed the, the vaccine in the first place because medical institutions could have been empowered to actually address infection in a way that would um, rapidly resolve infection without even requiring um, a vaccination.
vaccination. So like, even though I was like defending the vaccine, like the vaccine isn't even necessary if you actually know how viruses infect us. So fucking stupid. I don't know why I'm a fucking high school student and I, and, and, and I'm the person that's trying to get to talk about this stuff. <laughs> Did I say I was a high school student, high school grad? <laughs> it's been, it's been too long. My brain is not big enough to handle all this information. I only went to high school. Like I don't like, I don't possess the capacity to like be doing these things. And yet I am. <laughs> so anyway, um, sometimes, uh, Jorg, you feel extremely calm and blissful when you're alone in your dark room and open your eyes. But the moment you open your eyes and are exposed to light, the stress of the world, you get in a state of stress and flight or fight. Um, sorry, I need a bite of apple. It's been too long since I've eaten. An apple was not a good right snack to have here. Um. Okay, you you say sometimes. So that means that it's not all the time. Like it's not every time that you open your eyes, right? So it's only sometimes. So that's not really correlated with opening your eyes and being in the dark and being in the light. Um but I do remember Jorg that you have asked a lot of questions that make me believe that you have severe metabolic illness and trauma and i remember york i think it was probably a stream about sex when you were talking about um you know your lack of confidence and your romantic exploits and um erectile issues and stuff like that as well um like you know so i've had so we've had several streams right now actually that have all sort of been oriented around trauma, depression, anxiety, and alcoholism and addiction. And the same biological pathways which underlie um, anxiety and depression also underlie trauma. And they, they both, um, because they both cause each other. So like when you're a child and you're traumatized, that leads to depression. But then when you're depressed, you have more demoralizing experiences that cause more trauma. And then, but, and then trauma affects your endocrine system. So there is a direct correlation between your environment and your physical health. And so when, so when we talk about your issues a lot, like, I don't know that you're yet recognizing the connection between your experience and your biology. They are one in the same. And that's why a lot of people have a hard time resolving their health problems is because they don't recognize the connection between your metabolic health and your environment that goes both ways. So your diet and your dietary history, and if you have infections, like if you have oral disease, you know, that makes you more susceptible to stress reactions because your body's continually trying to fight uh, infection all the time. Um, and then on top of that, if you don't possess effective mental health skills, such as what the inventory teaches you, when you have those experiences, they are much more stressful and unpleasant for you because your brain is so much more traumatized by the experience. If you feel, and like this goes back to what I was talking about like with confidence. So, oh good, thanks for that measurement. I'll, but I'll get to that in a sec. So um, this goes back to like having confidence. Like confidence is not an attitude. It is it it is it it is a result of positive experiences and you cannot have those positive experiences if you don't facilitate them and trauma always present prevents us from facilitating confident experiences um like guys for instance guys who are not that good looking and you know you think all the time oh you you've got to have like this hot supermodel girlfriend or you're a loser you know, and then you and you go hit on girls that are way out of your league and you're going to get rejected like you're just reinforcing trauma. Right. But if you go talk to a girl that you, you know, is on your playing field and don't like and part of the problem is, is that you don't have compassion for yourself. Like you don't have compassion for yourself for being ugly, <laughs> even though even though you actually probably are not ugly at all. Like I, I, I kept saying how like I talk about like like I would settle for guys that I think were less attractive than me. 
Like I like I think like I actually like ugly guys. Like there's this kind of hot ugly guy who's like rough around the edges and not hot but just is so hot. Like do you know what I mean? <laughs> And But you don't know any of this when you go out and you're having like a romantic encounters and trying to pursue romance. People have their preferences. They have their traumas. They have their perceptions. They could reject you because you're beautiful. You know, Um, I have seen guys that identified as incels who were extremely good looking and their attitude about women and romance and their own self-worth did not come from their experiences of dating. It came from their childhood when they learned to hate themselves. You know, whether that's from your parents or from your environment and friends or early rejection experiences of rejection in romance. And the problem is, is that it's not real. This is your interpretation of reality and other human beings. You cannot read other people's minds. You do not know what they're thinking. You do not know what their life experience has been. And they could just be rejecting you because like, they don't like, um, tall people. I mean, I'm six foot seven. Do you know how many guys have rejected me just because I'm huge? A lot. There are a lot of tops out there (laughs) who want to fuck somebody who's shorter than them, they're not going to accept me as a boyfriend, right? Or even go to bed with me. But if my trauma makes me think that rejection reflects on my value as a person, rather than just some mundane like aspect like that, I'm going to be really, really traumatized by that. So like, so when you have, so Jorg, when you have these kinds of experiences where your attitude about yourself and life Um, it's basically, you can go like this. So your perceptions are determined by trauma and your endocrine system amplifies them. I made this uh, analogy actually to people who have phobias. It's like people who have phobias of like flying or spiders or the deep water. One of the reasons that they become phobias is because unlike people who do not have the phobia, when they encounter that stimulus, their endocrine system, their endocrine system is such that it is extremely sensitive to triggers for stress hormone uh, release, like adrenaline. They have far higher release of adrenaline and their body is much more susceptible to the effects of the adrenaline than someone who doesn't have the phobia. So someone without a phobia of flying can be a little bit thrilled and titillated by the prospect of flying. Yeah, maybe they're a little bit nervous, but like, it's going to be fun. So they get on the plane, no problem. A person with a phobia is encountered by, when they encounter that uh, scenario, their adrenaline just goes through the roof. So they literally become paralyzed by the amount of stress hormones that are being released. And it's not, so they have both the psychological trigger, which is, the fear of flying, but then they also have the biological factor, which is the intensity caused by the metabolic, the state of the metabolic system. And that happens everywhere in our lives. So like romance or like your perception of yourself, like if you are metabolically stressed, your, the things that trigger your trauma are going to be, you're going to experience them more intensely than people who have a healthy endocrine system. So that's why it's really, really important to get your diet under control, to get enough sunshine every single day, to treat yourself well, eat plenty of food, get lots of sugar, resolve pathogenic infections. And then the psychological therapy resolves the psychological triggers for those things that would release those stress hormones in the first place. So like before I did the therapy, every single morning of my life I woke up, I wished I was still sleeping or dead. I did not want to face life. I found it extremely stressful and and anxiety inducing. And even if I was having a nightmare, it was preferable than being awake. And every morning when I would wake up, I would just wish I could just somehow just sleep forever. And after doing the therapy, I wait, I can't wait to wake up every single morning. I get I actually get so excited about waking up in the morning that I don't like going to bed now because (laughs) because I like being up and doing things and being alive and experiencing my life for the first time in my life. And that was facilitated by the psychological therapy that I did, but also benefited from the nutritional therapy that healed my endocrine system and raised my dopamine levels and lowered my adrenaline. 
So they they play they play into there. So when you're talking about having these problems, like you know, one of the an example of how you would do actually your so an example. Oh God, this is the longest longest podcast I've ever done. So if um, <laughs> so if uh, I'm only saying that because I don't think people will click on long podcasts. You know, they want the short shit, and I'm trying to grow my audience, but whatever. Okay, but this stuff needs to be talked about. So, Jorg, so for instance, like, Jorg, if you were going to break open the inventory therapy and do it on this um, thing, you talk about, like, when you're alone in the dark and you open your eyes and you, um, uh, you get this, you, you, there's a huge, there's a huge aspect in there that you kind of just graze over, which is, and the stress of the world. What are you talking about, Jorg? You're not responsible for the stress of the world. <laughs> You don't, it doesn't matter what's going on in Russia and Ukraine for you. Although actually, unless it does, your name is Jorg. I'm uh, maybe you're um, Scandinavian. <laughs> like, you know, like there's a, at any time, and this plays back into the social media aspect of what I was talking about earlier. When we have um, control and um, coping mechanisms and have excessive unresolved trauma, news and social media can be a source of anger and frustration entertainment where you feel powerless to avoid it but yet you know that it's destructive because it's activating all of these like you know stress reactions in you um um you're we are not responsible for those things i you know we don't have control over anything like that we can't control what world leaders do we can't control what like celebrities do we can't control what like internet streamers do like none of that is in your um is in your responsibility is your responsibility at all but for some reason you feel um burdened by that stuff so like if you were to break open the inventory therapy what you would do is you would you you know you might start off with the resentment for um everything stressful that's going on in the world there's a lot of wars there's a lot of crazy people happening right now there's uh, I mean, it, things are kind of insane. There's a lot of political division and hatred. Um, and you would, you would write those in the inventory and uh, under the resentment and then, um, under cause. So the first, the first, the second column is like the cause column. Like where did those resentments come from? Well, the resentments come from kind of that they're just happening. Like, you know, Russia invaded Ukraine and, um, there's a lot of political turmoil in like the U S if you're in the U S and like COVID has just been ransacking, you know, the world for like two years and we haven't been able to go out and do all that. You write all of those things down in the cause. And that's, that's one of the ways in which like this therapy is very effective is that you're actually acknowledging like why these things are stressful. Like that doesn't really happen when you go to therapy, when you go to therapy and like, um, you tell uh, your therapist that you hate the way that your boyfriend treats you. They'll just be like, yeah, that sucks, doesn't it? Not like, why does that hurt you though? You know, like why, like let's explore like why that actually hurts you. Like it's because, you know, you love him or you invited him into your life or you were taught as a child that your value as a person was dependent on what other people, how other people perceive you. Like, and you get to write those things down in the cause. Like they're that stressful. Having these things is stressful. Um, and then the the third column in the inventory therapy is um, the parts hurt, which uh, which represent um, the, so like as human beings we all need certain things to be fulfilled and safe and happy, food, shelter, love, opportunity, um, uh, relationships, um, accomplishments, like those kinds of things. Um, there's there's a very few of them. The like so that's why you don't make them up. The in the in the third column of the parts of self that are hurt, you don't make up any of you choose from the list of available options. And that helps you identify how these things are hurting you. So your what's happening to you when you wake up in the morning and you get stressed out and have anxiety, you don't really understand what or why it's hurting you. Um because you don't have the tools to do that, but the in practicing the inventory is actively teaching yourself those tools. So when you write down, like, you know, uh, the part of the cause is that Russia invaded Ukraine and there's a lot of war going on. One of the reasons that it hurts you is because it damages your sense of safety. You know, that war could spread and there could be greater global conflict and that would affect your emotional security. And it could also affect your financial security. Um, and it could also affect your, um, ambitions, you know, your ambitions are to like, you know, have a peaceful society and go to work, but those things could all get disrupted 
And so then your ambitions would be impaired. And the re and when those aspects of being human are hurt, that is why we experience trauma is because something that we need, not just want, but something that we need becomes denied to us. And, you know, for instance, this is why, this is why like rejection can be so painful. Um, like when guys, especially guys, but this happens to girls too. Um, I say, especially guys, because, because guys are, um, a lot bigger babies about rejection. <laughs> <laughs> like we kind of, we kind of like, you know, we kind of like someone rejects us and we just get so infuriated and angry and dramatic and blah, and, and we're entitled. Um, but, um, but it's one of the, one of the reasons why rejection is so painful is because when you go and you hit on somebody, you have this ambition of getting with them, you know, whether it's for sex or a date or marriage, you know, you have ambitions to get like, you know, a personal relationship or an intimate relationship with somebody. Um, and when you're rejected, that ambition is subverted and that's painful. But, in, but because we don't have compassion for ourselves, we will lash out at the people that rejected us and blame them for rejecting us. I cannot tell you how many guys in Los Angeles hate me because I wouldn't have sex with them, which is fucking insane, right? Like, it is not my obligation to bed every guy in Los Angeles that wants me, even if I am slutty. And trust me, I'm sl I'm a slut. But like, you know, like there's these people that exist in the circles that I ran in down there who just talks bad about me and hate me and their friends hate me because I wouldn't go home with them and their boyfriend or I flirted with them and then I didn't go home with them. It's so fucking stupid, especially because I wasn't flirting with a lot of those people. I was just being nice to them. And then they chose to interpret that as flirting because they were so hopeful that I might go to bed with them. Um, but that's why rejection is so painful is because we have an ambition to get something for ourselves and then it gets denied. But then because we don't possess self-compassion for ourselves, we end up retaliating or reacting toward other people as if they're the bad person for rejecting us, which it's not. There's nothing wrong with rejecting somebody like, you know, Jesus Christ. Um, that idea causes so much harm to people. You know, like I talked about earlier, like people people staying in relationships for years when they're not happy and they're hating the other person just because they don't want to be mean. That's fucking stupid. <laughs> You're wasting your own time on that. The time that you waste ruminating about a rejection is time you could be hitting up somebody else and having more fun with somebody that will have you. Um, I was actually counseling somebody about this the other day they got rejected by somebody um, and kind of just inadvertently, they actually had a fun time with the person. They had a little bit of sexy time and um, thought that it would might lead to something else. And it didn't, the person just like disappeared on them. And so they sort of started to wallow in it and were wondering how they could be less um, fixated on, uh, on it, which was a really healthy way to process this, right? Being self-aware, self-critical like you know having compassion for themselves that like yeah it really sucked that they were like you know not answering the phone you know um but what what else could you do about it besides trying to make it work and um they didn't even think of the actual solution to the problem which was just to go out and start talking to more girls <laughs> get back on those other apps that you found this nice great person that you know turned out to not be nice and just do more Find more girls, find more attractive girls or men, you know, distract yourself. Don't just dump all your eggs in one basket. But because that person had never been taught these kinds of skills and had, had never been taught self-compassion, they were so um, uh, sidelined by the rejection that they couldn't even have compassion for themselves to go out and pursue other options, right? So... Um, so, so, so when you do like the inventory and you have like the, and then you've got the third column that is the parts of self hurt, like when you identify, um, why you were hurt, uh, it's really cathartic because you're not just making it up, right? Like you really are hurt. Like you, you got hurt and you don't have to convince anyone else. You don't have to, um, you don't have to, um, uh, have arguments with your better partner, with your better half or your parents to convince them that you, that your feelings are legitimate. You do it for yourself. 
in that therapy by identifying the parts of self that were hurt, you know, and then, and then your, um, like the stress of the world, like you're talking about, you would go into, um, the, the next column is the, my part and the, my part in the, my part, we address, uh, the things that we did in response uh, in during or in response to this event or issue. Um, and you know, uh, your like, um, uh, a lot of people will put down emotions in this part. Like I let them make me feel stressed or I let them make me feel angry. And we don't have control over our emotion, our emotions. Actually, the, a lot of people don't understand this. Our emotions are hormones. You, you, can have a little bit of influence around them, but generally, no, you don't. Like, they're they're hormones. Like, you know, if somebody hurts you, you are going to have a physical response to that. You know, that is not part of your part. That goes in the cause. Part of the problem when we are dealing with trauma is that we adopt parts of the trauma that we actually had no control over. Um, being disappointed by somebody or hurt by somebody is not, trying to have a better attitude about it is not within your control. Um, that goes under the cause. Like if I say this in the book, like if someone comes into your house and stabs you, like you're going to be upset about that, right? <laughs> oh, just change your attitude. You know, that's not how this life fucking works. If someone rejects you or a boss doesn't hire you, or you feel like you look like shit on a certain day, you know, those kinds of things you don't have control over. They go under the cause column in the inventory therapy because we don't have control over them. But we are usually trying to take control of those things. And since we don't have control of those things, we are not effective in our lives. So putting them in the column and recognizing that they actually aren't in our control makes us more effective in our life. And so under the my part, you know, you're, you could write down that you are adopting a lot of like global stress and conflict as if it's your own personal problem. And it's not, you don't have control over those things. You can't, um, you know, you can't affect those kind that kind of stuff. All you can do is show up for opportunity and try your best. And that has nothing to do with like world events. Um, unless they directly affect you. Um, Mostly, you know, social media facilitates a lot of like fear mongering and, and problems with stuff like that because um, we misunderstand what our own responsibility is because of the trauma we went through as children. Your parents, a lot of times, most of our childhood was spent trying to navigate and survive our own parents. So we learn all of these um, um, coping and control mechanisms to control our parents. And then when we get to be adults, we think that we actually are responsible for a lot of things that we actually are not responsible for. One of the things that I mentioned in my book on parenting is that you're not actually responsible for the survival or success of your child. But a lot of parents think that they're, it's only their responsibility and become extremely stressed out by the prospect of like losing children. Like, like, you know, and or a lot of parents will do things like um, excessively shelter their children, right? Like they'll keep them at home all the time. They do helicopter parenting. They homeschool. They keep their kids from having developmental experiences in, this, in the desire to keep their children safe. They actually end up causing a lot of trauma. Um, it's actually not your job as a parent to keep your child alive. <laughs> you know, your only job as a parent is to do your best. And to show up for opportunity, you know, um, sure. If you're starving your children, that's a fucked up thing to do. Right. And, but, but like, that's not doing your best, you know, um, some parents can't feed their children and they feel really bad about it because of their economic, um, disenfranchisement and the way that our capitalist system, um, disproportionately burdens, um, different parts of society. Um, and then if you feel shame and like a failure for not being able to parent in the way that you think you should be parenting, um, that can impair your effectiveness further because you're so upset about your, about, about not being able to do, uh, one thing that you might miss other things that you can do. Um, you know, like that, ask for help, um, which a lot of, a lot of people won't ask for help because we're, we're so, our ego has been so conditioned as a child to, 
uh, deny any kind of personal vulnerability that we won't do things that we need to do, like take care of our children by asking for help. Um, even though we need it, you know? Um, so in the, my part, a lot of people finally for the, for that's how, like I told this story earlier in the stream about my experience with Dudley, my little cocker spaniel and thinking that I was responsible for his torment. Um, and that's when I did my part in an inventory on it that I realized that, uh, I had shown up and I had tried my best. Um, and it wasn't, you know, my fault that he had to go through that. And, and that, that, that is what, um, gay allowed me to then finally for the first time in my life in 20 years to consider that, um, he had probably had a really great life after he left us and that it was probably the responsible thing for my dad to do to give him up when he wasn't willing to let this little vulnerable dog live inside the house to find a better home for him. And that he probably had a great life. He could have had a horrible life. He could have gotten sold to some, you know, dog meat, um, black market <laughs> producer, but that's fucking insane. Right? Like a cocker spaniel, like my dad, he probably gave him to like a really nice old, um, couple, or a middle-aged couple who like had a space for a dog like that. Um, and he probably had a really good life. And I wasn't able to recognize that until I did the, my part of that inventory, because I had been assuming responsibility for stuff that I actually had no responsibility for. And that's, that's also another reason why this trauma therapy works is because a lot of trauma causes us to think that we have responsibility for things that we absolutely do not have responsibility for our mortality, you know, um, world events, uh, social dynamics, um, making people stay in a relationship with us. You can't do that. Like you can, no matter how hard you try, you cannot make somebody stay with you. Um, even if you lock them in the basement and they're chained up, they will hate you. They, they're, they're not there on their own free will. <laughs> So like, you know, you can't, we cannot do that. And some people are so afraid of that lack of control that they will do horrible things like chain people up in the basement. Like, you know, that makes you a terrible person and you've done horrible things and will make your life even more miserable. Like, but we do little things like that in our day-to-day -day interactions. If you give a, um, one, one way in, in control in which we self-sabotage in relationships, like people will give their partners a present, Right. Because like if you give them a gift, they'll then they're just gonna love you, right? And they're gonna um they're gonna just be so appreciative of it because you're so self-sacrificing, and they're gonna love you forever. And then like you know, and then they will never leave you. So the gift giving actually has a nefarious, manipulative purpose. And then by that extension, you are manipulative <laughs> because you're not giving them the gift to give them a gift. You're giving them a gift because you want it to have an effect but then it doesn't have that effect. And then you get really angry and then you yell at them. So not only did you give them a gift they didn't like that was manipulative in the first place, you then start making it their fault that they don't like it. It's fucking insane, but people do it all the time. I was coaching somebody once whose partner <coughs> bought them a vacation to Bermuda. And when he got the present, he was like, I don't fucking want to go to Bermuda. I'm busy, which he should have. Like he was, she, she should have taken time off like Jesus fucking Christ. But like, you know, he, he didn't want it. He didn't like it and it didn't have the intended effect. And then his partner just lost their shit at him and blew up. And like, it became this big fight. And so like, you know, you were never giving a gift because you were a nice person. You were actually giving a gift because you're manipulative but you're manipulative because you're traumatized because you're so afraid of people leaving you and you don't have compassion for yourself that you end up doing this crazy, insane shit. <laughs> and that that's why it becomes really important to resolve your experiences of trauma is because you need to um, find compassion for yourself so you can be more effective in your life. Because a lot of our problems that we experience in life are from our own making. That's a actually a really um, famous tenet of AA that our problems are of our own making. And if you look at your problems, a lot of them are. You know, I got sick in part because I was always trying not to get sick. I was starving myself and I was working out too much and I was taking weird supplements and I wasn't eating a lot of, I was eating food that I thought was healthy, 
like avoiding sugar, but in fact, our biology actually is highly dependent on sugar. So like I was hurting myself because I was operating from a place of trauma. Um, so that's why it becomes so important to actually address your trauma um, so that these things don't happen. I'm sorry if I haven't answered your questions and you're no longer here, but maybe if you come back and restart, you will. So um, what was the next question? Okay, no more questions. I'm gonna stop after these ones. <laughs> um, Alice Miller seems uh, popular in 12 step circles. It speaks to authoritarian underpinnings in culture. Wait. Um, Mercy, sorry. Do you mean um, uh, drama of the, oh yeah, drama of the gifted child. I think I hate that book. <laughs> I, I hope I'm, I hope I'm not wrong, but I think that's one of the books that I absolutely hate. Um, I, I think one of the reasons it's popular in um, 12 step circles is because it feeds into um, a lot of, a lot of, you know, okay. So you know how I talked about, um, people responding to insecurity by trying to adopt confidence, but it's actually arrogance because you don't adopt confidence. You learn it. Um, people often respond to insecurity and low feelings of self-worth by adopting grandiosity, um, as a coping mechanism. And so, um, and 12 step circles are nothing but just a whole bunch of people who are fucking traumatized beyond all recognition and um so things like that things like that can be really um uh po popular or or influential in those circles because it actually entertains trauma not because it is beneficial to it so um and do you mean you're you're a survivor of um like like of of ad addictive uh people or you were an act addict, addict yourself um Book of Importance of the Compassionate Witness. I don't, um, I'm not familiar enough to know what that means, Compassionate Witness. Um, let me look this up though, real quick. Trauma of the Gifted Child. I think this is like a self pity promoting book. Um, Uh, I can't really tell much about exactly what it is. There's no Wikipedia. Um, um, the blurb sounds okay. I don't remember if that's a book that I, I if I'm familiar with. I might be thinking of something else. <laughs> I'm just largely skeptical of everybody because so much of this stuff failed me in the first place. And the solution that actually helped me finally fix all of these problems uh, wasn't in any of this kind of stuff. Oh, yeah. I hate... It's saying stuff like false self and true self and I actually hate that kind of lingo. Like and sorry to shit on your on your suggestion. And I'm eating an apple again. Um and people talk about living authentically. Like um people everyone is living authentically. Like every single person on the planet is living authentically. Like if you're a fucking thief and a con artist, like that's your true self. Like that's your life. That's who you are. Like you're living authentically. It's destructive <laughs> and awful. A, a, a lot of the times like living authentically and true self is really just kind of like, it's kind of a liberal virtue signaling where you're kind of like, like there's a best version of yourself that you can be if only you tried hard enough. And that's, that could not be further from what like my work accomplishes. Like my work specifically seeks to address experiences of trauma and why they happen and the effect that they have on us rather than, you know, being philosophical. Although I am 
very much a philosopher, but a lot of other people's philosophy to me is just masturbatory. <laughs> and also, I also don't like the way that people talk about narcissism. It's mentioned in here. A lot of people really misunderstand narcissism, especially in the mental health therapy world. So a lot of people, like, like fundamentally, people characterize narcissists as um, antagonists. Like they are the bad guy. Like the narcissist is the problem. And that's not true. And a lot of people who fixate on narcissists and let me, and, 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 you know, and I'm saying this as a victim of very many narcissists, um, people fixate on narcissists because they need a bad guy. But the problem is, is there is no bad guy. Um, our problems originate from trauma, not from evil, even though there is a lot of evil, evil originates from trauma. And um, people are not inherently evil. The evil that happens is a cope, our coping and control mechanisms that where people are trying to um, deal with trauma that they've experienced with limited um, uh, tools tools to to do that. I actually mentioned what did I do this? Oh, I added um, I added sociopathy to my book. Um, in the upcoming update in the chapter on, um, depression, uh, PTSD and, um, and, um, uh, um, anxiety because sociopathy is very specifically a deficit of hormones. Um, everyone that has sociopathy has, um, metabolic derangements and it's because, um, progesterone is the hormone of empathy. And progesterone can very often result in uh, metabolic uh, dysfunction, um, but it also facilitates empathy. It's one of the reasons why, like when women, when you get your period, um, or if men, and I, I know this because I took progesterone therapeutically. And when I would take progesterone, I was a miserable crying mess. Everything made me cry. <laughs> cute dogs, you know, uh, something nice that my niece or nephews would do. Um, I would just cry all the time. And it was because, um, it was because progesterone is the hormone of empathy, empathy and sociopaths have, um, metabolic problems that, uh, originate from emotional trauma, but are also worsened by nutritional and environmental problems that ends up causing them to have a deficit of progesterone. And so if you give a narcissist or a sociopath supplemental progesterone, they will actually start feeling empathy for other people. Um, and you can also restart progesterone synthesis by fixing your me metabolic health, like I talk about in my book um, and everything that talks about, you know, the endocrine system. Um, so these kinds of these kinds of characterizations of uh, psychology that are only psychology bother me because they don't know, um, how the human body is actually constructed and functions and how much of it is involved in the endocrine system and narcissism, narcissism. Also, I don't, I also don't understand why people don't really understand what narcissism is. Narcissism is a coping mechanism that originates, um, from child, a childhood that is, um, uh, extremely deprived of emotional intimacy with parents. Um, and that's one of the reasons why there's a lot of narcissism in, um, the baby boomer generation is because their parents having gone through world war two and being raised by parents who went through world war one did not have unfettered access to their parents emotionally. Um, their parents were very, um, cut off, um, because of the trauma of the, of going through war. And so then that in turn deprived children of the emotional intimacy that's required for healthy childhood development. And then narcissism is just like self-pity. Okay, so self-pity is the victim in, in the Cartman drama triangles model of psychological trauma. Uh, self-pity goes with the victim psycho um, psyche and narcissism is the opposite equivalent which accompanies the uh, persecutor, the type one um, psyche. And so narcissism is an adaptive um, survival response to a lack of um, compassion and 
emotional connection with your own parents and it substitutes um self value when none is um forthcoming from the environment so i just like people and i'm related to a therapist who is just fucking obsessed with narcissists and 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 um and uh characterizes narcissists as only men and that they're always men <laughs> and it's not true <laughs> And it's also not how narcissism works. Like they're not, they, they can do evil things, but they are not evil. Like no one is inherently evil. People can do evil things. And those evil things are usually a result. Oh, and this reminds me too. So I was going to talk, went back way back when, like five hours ago, when I was going to talk about, um, when I was going to talk about, uh, when I was talking about finger sucking, um, this is, this just blows my mind. Okay. So you know how I talked about how finger sucking is a, uh, manifestation of the deficit of emotional intimacy that is required um, from a parent for a child. Children need to feel physically close to their parents. Otherwise they get stressed. And then the thumb sucking or finger sucking is a, um, is a, is a self um, self soothing um, behavior to treat that, to, to deal with that stress that of the lack of um, contact. Germans, before World War II, had have this insane uh, childhood uh, fable, folktale, of a demonic tailor that will come along and slice off your fingers that you suck. <laughs> they literally tell their children, or used to, I don't think they do anymore, they literally used to tell their children that a demon would come along and cut off your finger if you suck it. So since finger sucking is a self-soothing mechanism to help children cope with the emotional and physical absence of their parents, having neither the emotional access or physical access to their parents in addition to not being able to suck their fingers, turn them into fucking psychopaths who, you know, started Nazi Germany and World War II and killed, you know, millions of people. And, um, like, and, and, and there was this other insane kind of behavior that, um, that, that evolved out of that culture. Like, have you ever seen, you know, in movies how they like, um, Nazis are very often portrayed with like a big slash across their face, like a big scars on their faces. And you kind of just assume that like that was gotten in battle somehow that like maybe they were in the, in a war, another war sometime or training and they got hit in the face and have this ugly scar that makes them look like a villain. That's not where that comes from. The reason that so many Nazis has have disfiguring facial scars is because they would practice fencing purposefully without protective gear to purposefully get slashed on the face and get a scar. And that is exactly the kind of behavior that is a result of the kind of trauma when little kids are raised to believe that a demon is going to come along and cut off their fingers if they suck them by parents who were, you know, traumatized by, you know, other many centuries of like, you know, insane, um, empire, empire, uh, conquests by, you know, Hungary and Austria and, you know, all that other, and the, the Prussian state. I mean, you know, th that was just a, that was just a natural conclusion to centuries of war trauma, um, that insane kind of behavior. Um, but anyway, so like, um, uh, yeah, so I wanted to mention that, uh, that, 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 that finger sucking trauma around. Um, so like, that's the kind of stuff that like causes narcissism. It's not just because narcissists are like bad people. It's because they went through trauma where they were denied love and affection as children. And, um, you know, and you, if you're a narcissist, you, you can overcome that by learning to show yourself compassion through these kinds of practices. Like if you practice inventory therapy and you do it right, you can't like entertain self pity, but if you do it as is instructed, you'll learn how to have compassion for yourself. And that then extends to having compassion for other people. Um, because fundamentally, you know, when we don't show compassion to others, it's because we don't know how to show it for ourselves. You can't share something you don't have for yourself.
So I've been rambling again. I need to hurry through these so we can end. Um, uh, MDMA ecstasy has been found as a helpful talk therapy. Yeah. No, it doesn't raise serotonin. Uh, everything that says it's com really complex. Um, uh, they theorize that it does that. They don't actually have studies that show that. Like if you, I, I don't think I've looked for them. They're, they, they're, I, I don't think they're there. When you look at studies that talk about the neurochemical and hormonal effects of psych meds, they usually are postulating what it does, but not actually showing that it does that. And even if it does do that, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that is the only thing that it does. Like it could, it could raise like, you know, serotonin and dopamine are kind of related. Like, um, they're, I think is serotonin also a catecholamine. Um, they're, they're related in some family. Um, but like, 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 like a lot of those can affect other things. So, so scientists and researchers and, and medical practitioners will say that it does it, but they're not actually, the study is not literally like re measuring the hormonal output under the influence of those things. Um, ecstasy, actually, I don't know which one ecstasy does, but I know cocaine, like cocaine specifically suppresses serotonin, which is why it gets rid of shame and guilt. And then why people who are cocaine addicts um, have often also done a lot of really horrible things is because the burden of the shame, that the sheer amount of shame that they experience is really unbearable. And so they, um, but they, because they don't know how, they don't have the skills to, maintain relationships. I mean, that's also one of the, um, so like, so like, so like, uh, a lot of us, like a lot of our trauma, um, also, uh, arises out of the inability to do things like maintain healthy relationships. I mean, how many of you are from, um, traumatic backgrounds, and your parents were completely dysfunctional and maybe didn't have any friends or very little friends, you know, like, um, uh, uh, they don't have those skills to pass on to us. They could never have taught us those things because they don't know them themselves. That's the entire point of like my book and this trauma therapy. It's not that parents purposefully abuse their children, although sometimes they do. It's because they lack the more effective skills that would empower them to not do it in the first place. They just don't have them. Your parents can't teach you to be a good person if they don't have the skills to be a good person either in the first place, right? Um, so like, so, so like when you have addiction issues, and you like, you know, you lack the skills to maintain personal relationships. Um, that's why a lot of people rely, lean heavily into the addictive substances because those are a shortcut to circumventing, uh, short circuiting the um, negative, exp the hormonal aspect of the and neurological aspect of the consequences of those problems. But like, for instance, like a lot of people, like how many of you in here are completely, um, terrified at the prospect of telling people sorry or maybe you just know people who just like they would rather die than tell someone sorry my dad has never said sorry to me in his entire life um i used to be really resentful about that and um it certainly um impairs our relationship because he has done a lot of really horrible things to me um but i did not really possess the ability to amend relationships either I, I could tell people sorry, uh, but I didn't know how to actually make things better and actually maintain a healthy personal relationship. And that's this therapy teaches you how to do that because like, like for instance, like we just get really scared about apologizing, telling people sorry, or like, you know, amending relationships because we don't know how, because we were never taught how to do it before. Being able to tell someone sorry and fixing a mistake is not only one of the easiest things you can do, it actually works in your best interest because it demonstrates to people that are important to you that you are willing to subvert your own ego, ego in order, Igor, oh, that was a really getting late. Um, you are willing to subvert your own ego uh, in sacrifice to the relationship. And that communicates to people that you're invested and that you're worth spending time with. But one of the reasons that my parents and my aunts and uncles have no friends um, is because they don't possess 
the skills to amend mistakes. They don't know how to say sorry and to actually amend errors in judgment and treatment of others. Um, and so they don't. And that is required, though, to maintain personal relationships. It is, inevi it is inevitable that you will offend someone that you are in a relationship with, whether it's platonic or romantic. And if you can't properly amend that mistake, uh, it will it will start it will ruin or start to ruin the relationship, and then that harms your best interests. So um, you know that's why I keep talking about these as skills, like they are skills that you need in order to be effective in your life. And one of the reasons why we are repeatedly ineffective in our lives is simply because we lack those skills because our parents did not have them to teach us, and. Some people are are, are are lucky enough to have had parents like that, or you might have been able to learn them through your own experiences growing up. But if you don't have those skills, if you repeatedly find yourself um, stressed out and anxious, if you have problems with work, if you, work gives you anxiety, like one of the things I didn't realize and um, when I was like, until I was like in recovery and did actually did some of this work is that work is work is such a smoke and mirrors. Do you know what the purpose of work is? Work is not, the purpose of work is not to like go be productive and make money. The purpose of work is just an excuse to be around other human beings. <laughs> like that's what work is. People go to work so they can get away from their families and just have more relationships and just talk to people and have an excuse to talk to people all day long. What are you going to do at home if you just stay at home all day? Like, hey, yeah, um... Let's clean the house again, you know, <laughs> like, like the point of work is to go and have active um, experiences in communicating and collaborating with other human beings. It is has nothing to do with making money and it has nothing to do with being productive. It's only about human relationships. And because I was so traumatized from my childhood, I didn't even know that. And I was terrified of my bosses and resentful of my colleagues and scared of them, too. Um and um, and I wasn't able to develop healthy relationships with people like that because I miss I didn't even know that that was real, and I and I only found out that was real after doing extensive inventories on my trauma surrounding authority figures and work and um, finances and and all that stuff. So so anyway, that was another long answer. Um, Lou, you've heard GABA has some connection to tinnitus. Is that consenting with your understanding? I, consistent. Um, actually, I don't know what causes tinnitus. Um, I've had it once in a while, but it's never been persistent. And um, since I've been um, investigating a lot of other things, I've never even really given it a thought. Um, I think if... Um, GABA could play a role, but I think that, I think that that's sort of reductive. I think that tinnitus, uh, would just be, um, an overexcitation of, or dis, uh, dysfunction in the electroconductivity of the cells that are attached to the, um, the hairs that, uh, facilitate hearing in the ear. Um, and, uh, um, like the vibrations and they, and, and they, um, and the, um, and the excess, like the, the dysregulation of electrical conductivity. And so GABA could participate in it for that sense, because GABA does actually have functions like that, but so do excitatory, um, processes. I've had tinnitus, um, occasionally once in a while, like after I took vitamin C or like, um, maybe niacinamide, um, uh, but mine never really lasted very long, maybe about like a minute. And then I would just not even notice when it went away. Um, so I don't, I don't know the specifically GABA. I would not, I wouldn't, I wouldn't specifically pin GABA to that exactly, but just general neurological dysregulation caused by, you know, all the many things that cause that. <laughs> um, Jorg, uh, in the morning you measured 34 Celsius body temperature under your tongue. Okay. Jorg, don't worry about your morning temperatures. Um, the most, the only important number that matters during the day is the peak that you can reach during the day, your highest rate. Don't worry about the morning. Not important. Um, uh, I mean, it, it's important if they're like really low, um, and dangerous, but then if that's the case, then your, um, 
than your uh your peak uh uh wouldn't be very high anyway um and the peak represents how high your metabolic rate can get up to every day so uh don't focus on the uh lowest temperature focus on the highest temperature and do all the steps in my chapters on self therapy uh and um vitamin C and, and else to you and use those tools to drive your, not drive, drive is not the right word, to coax your metabolic rate high, as high as you can. Um, don't really focus on the morning one so much. doesn't really matter too much. Um, you understand it's not easy to make teeth right, lack the money. Oh, well, no, no, you are, you don't need to, you don't need to, um, you don't need to go for a big old dentist treatment. Just go get your teeth cleaned. Um, it's not very expensive. They're, it's the, one of the cheapest procedures you can have. Um, just go get them cleaned. That's all you need to do. It'll help so much. Um, you know, they, they'll try to upsell you with their x-rays and all this other stuff. Say, nope, I don't want x-rays. Just say I, all I want. This is, York, this is an example of how trauma prevents people from taking care of their own interests. I was working with somebody once who was having a lot of health problems. And the stuff we were not do, we were doing was not working. Working, and I suggested that they go get antibiotics because I knew that they had an infection and I was not able to address it. But I knew that they could get certain antibiotics and that it would go away. And they just clammed up and shut down and stopped coaching with me. And you know they they had fear probably around using antibiotics and wiping out their gut microbiome. But like th those kinds of things are a result of trauma. And that person, to my best knowledge never got that treated and has still been suffering with those um, same problems just because they refuse to go use antibiotics. And so like, you know, a lot of people don't go to the dentist because they're afraid to tell the dentist that they don't want fucking x-rays. But like, you can say that. <laughs> Part of taking care of yourself is by asking for what you need. And if what you need is to not have x-rays and just get teeth cleaning, go say that. And if that's hard to do, for you, you can do a resentment inventory and a fear inventory, like I mentioned in my books, to process the reasons why that's so um, intimidating for you. Um, because it's probably a result of trauma in which you are afraid to ask for what you need and go get and to take care of yourself and go get those things done. So do an inventory on it. Go get your teeth cleaned. It'll help you immensely. Um. Lou, sorry, Lou, it's been a long time since you mentioned that. Beliefs are a perceptual filter. Um, yeah. Um, thanks. Okay, good job, guys. <laughs> thanks for hanging in there. That was really long. Uh, they won't all be as long. I guess trauma is a lot more of a serious topic than I anticipated. Um, if you're not subscribed or uh, or like uh, or um, uh, if you want notifications here or you can go to my Twitter, links underneath the video. Uh, give um, uh, notifications for future streams. Um, if you like, uh, comment and share my or share my video, it helps um, increase its uh, recommendation in the algorithm. Um, and that would be very much appreciated. Um, you're welcome. Thank you guys for hanging out and being here. Um... <coughs> oh, that was a recall. Um, they are. Well, I also enjoy it because, um, I think it gives some clarity to, uh, my book writing and helps point people to point people to places in my book. They might not be aware of, even if they have read it because it's long as well. Um, I stopped gaming though, because, um, the gaming takes a long time and, um, I don't think it really is doing much for spreading my work around, but, uh, thanks Marcy. Um, I hope you guys have a rest, a uh, good rest of your day, um, and week and, um, take care of yourselves, you know, learn how to show yourself compassion. That's, that's the key. And this, that's what this inventory does is it teaches you how to do it. Um, but you can, you know, in your, you know, in everything that you do, you can exercise self-compassion. That's really the key to overcoming trauma. Um, it's okay to be rejected. It's okay to be fat. It's okay to be ugly. <laughs> It's okay to be good looking. Um, you know, it's okay when you lose things and you don't su succeed, you know, have compassion for yourself. 
um, take the action of doing inventory to resolve your trauma. Um, it can go a real long way. Okay. Ending now. I will see you all later. Bye.